Welcome. This is a specially called meeting of the Budget and Finance, Affordable Housing and Human Services Committees. Our goal is to discuss 50 million requests in council and AARP funds to address homeless. Uh, we have a pretty long menu uh, for tonight, so I'm going to recap that real quickly so everybody knows where we're going. Uh, first, we're going to get a welcome by uh, Mayor John Cooper. There's going to be a discussion of best practices and strategies by Dr. Joe Savage. Overview of investment requests of 50 million in homeless. Specifics of legislation. This is broken down into the four um, separate uh, resolutions. Then there's an expert panel to address questions. Then there's public comment, and then council questions is the is the agenda. Um, two minutes for public comment, um, and we'll we get to you when we get there. Um, if the council has other questions when we get there, or if you can't stay for the entire meeting, if you'll submit those, then we will um, uh, take on those as we get to. Okay, our first on uh, the agenda, Mayor Cooper, welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Would you like to come up here or down no, there? No, 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 okay. I, I be... okay, let me get this microphone. It should be on, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, can you all? Maybe the other one here. There we go. Okay. Ooh, wrong. Okay. Right. Have the screen. Well, uh, it's good to see everybody here. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Council Member, for the opportunity to kick off this very important discussion. Now, I know everybody in this room agrees that Nashville must do more to help our most vulnerable. We all agree we must do more to get our unhoused neighbors off the streets and into stable housing and to receive the services needed to stay housed. And I suspect we all agree that this has been somebody else's problem for too long. And it has persisted now for decades. And as our city's leadership, it's on us to take that on. Now, I'm heartened that we all come to this conversation with this common purpose and a shared belief that inaction is not an option. And I'm proud of the plan that you'll be considering today. It is grounded in a proven national model that has been successful in cities across the country. Now, for example, Houston implemented a similar approach a little more than a decade ago, and they have seen a 63% drop in the number of homeless people in their city by moving 25,000 people from the streets into stable housing. Milwaukee has reduced their homelessness by 92%. Austin, Texas has seen similar reductions as did Mobile, Alabama, Columbus, Ohio, San Diego, California, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, what do these cities have in common? They share the housing first model, and that is the philosophy our plan is built on. The four pieces of legislation you're considering today are all essential pieces of the puzzle. One cannot be effective without the other. Increasing capacity for temporary gap housing allows us to move more quickly to relocate our homeless off the streets and the funding for supportive wraparound services helps us keep folks off the streets. But the system will not work without permanent supportive solutions that MDHA will be building and creating with the $25 million. This is in complete alignment with the ARP guidance issued by the United States Treasury Department and is in line with the White House Housing Supply Action Plan. Now, we designed this plan to work as a unit, and I would urge you to keep that important fact in mind as you discuss and vote next week. Now, finally, I want to call attention to the unique opportunity to fund a plan that meets the magnitude of the problem and the urgency to move forward. The upfront costs of instituting a true Housing First plan are steep, that's why the opportunity to, to make American Rescue Plan federal dollars available to finance these initial costs is huge. We must capitalize on that opportunity. And also, urgently, Metro's cold weather protocols begin in November. That's less than five short weeks away. To do our part, 
Assuming council approves these funds, we are ready to expedite the implementation of this plan. On the same night the council votes on the plan, we're asking the council to approve a grant to Community Care Fellowship to expand their mobile housing navigation so we can start housing more people immediately. And once the funds are approved, the Metro Homeless Impact Division will release an RFP to create housing first supportive services immediately. We should also have a contract with the Salvation Army for additional hotel rooms by the second council meeting in October. Now I deeply appreciate the council's dedication and passion on this topic. The suffering happening on our streets is tragic and unacceptable to all of us. So I urge that we move forward with the $50 million plan so we can begin getting help to the folks who need it as soon as possible. Thank you and thank you for this discussion today and I hope on to the approval of this important plan for all of Nashville. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Cooper. Um, next we have, um, um, and I know a lot of people put a lot of effort into this project, so truly appreciate it. Uh, next we have Best Practices Strategies by Dr. Joe Savage. He's a Senior Regional Advisor in the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. Now this is virtual, so if technology works, uh, we will see it on the screen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Joe Savage. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation uh, to put up on the screen at the moment, but I just wanted to highlight quickly some of the best practices that we are advocating and pushing for at the federal level. We are certainly excited about the plan that you all have developed and what you're seeking to do, and the reductions that the mayor just mentioned in those comparable cities have been done because of the implementation of these best practices, and they will also be reflected in the up upcoming federal strategic plan that we will be releasing in um, a couple of weeks. And one of the things that we emphasize at the federal level in terms of best practices is that first and foremost, if we wanna talk about preventing and ending homelessness and developing a plan, that plan really must be centered on an all of community approach. And that all of community approach has to have embedded within it an all of government approach. So it's going to take sectors across the government as well as sectors across the community to truly develop and implement a plan to prevent and end uh, homelessness because we know that homelessness is a systemic issue. And then secondly, in terms of best practices, any plan must be centered on racial equity. We know that persons of color are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. And so that plan from prevention to the solutions must be centered around uh, racial equity in which the community is analyzing their data. They're looking for those disproportionate impacts and outcomes, and they're making the appropriate adjustments. And then also housing must be contextualized as a human right. Housing cannot be in a plan that is contextualized as something that must be earned or something that is done as a reward or something that is given as a result of uh, certain behavior. So we must understand that housing is a human right. And related to that, we know that the evidence shows and proves that housing first works. And when we're talking about housing first as a best practice, it's important that we understand we're talking about true fidelity to housing first. It's not just taking a person out of homelessness and placing them into housing, but it's placing them into housing and giving them the necessary services and supports that they need so that they can remain successfully housed. And related to housing, Housing first and reason why we know it works because when we look at the social determinants of health, housing is health care. People fare better in their health care addressing their underlying social problems when they are stably housed first and not vice versa. So the evidence and the data shows that housing first works and so any community plan must be rooted into housing first if you want to see uh, the reductions that are being done in other cities. And then related to that, when we're talking about um, housing first, it really must 
implement a low barrier approach to housing, not based upon preconditions, not based upon pre-requirements, but it must be centered in a low barrier approach to housing first. And then any implementation of a plan and development of that plan must include the voices of the persons who are experiencing a homelessness. That is key and they must be involved in the planning, in the implementation, and even the monitoring in a meaningful way that compensates them accordingly. They must be involved in the decision-making processes and the accountability processes as well. And then also the plan must be centered on local data. We want communities to implement plans that are based upon these uh, evidence-based practices, but that are tailored to local data and local needs so that the plan fits that community uh, specifically. And then that plan must have a strong prevention component if we're going to implement a plan to um, end homelessness, it's going to be without purpose if we don't cut off the faucet. So prevention has to be a key element of any plan to uh, end homelessness. And then the plan must focus on housing and not handcuffs. A plan cannot be centered on criminalizing behavior that people seek to fulfill their necessary needs, sleeping, eating. But the decriminalization of homelessness is key in any plan that seeks to prevent and end homelessness. So those are just a highlight of the best practices that we are promoting at the federal level as federal priorities, and we hope that any plan that any community develops will incorporate these uh, best practices. And as I mentioned before, they will be reflected in the upcoming federal strategic plan that we will be releasing in a couple of weeks. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Dr. Savage. Appreciate it. Um, next, uh, we have an overview of the investment of the $50 million in homeless. Uh, and April uh, Calvin, Interim Director, the Metro Homeless Impact Division, Jaha Martin, Chair Homeless Planning Council, and H Hannah Carnejo Nell, HMIS Manager, will be presenting. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'll get you. Go ahead. Hi there, I would like to thank Dr. Joe Savage and Mayor Cooper for those moving remarks and for their vision and leadership. I'm April Calvin, the Interim Director of the Metro Homeless Impact Division, the department that is deeply dedicated to supporting our unhoused Nashville neighbors and connecting them to the services that they need. We address homelessness by using a collaborative approach between Metro government, our valuable, community partners, and nonprofits. This work is not done in a silo. Today you're gonna to hear a great story of community collaboration where agencies and partners removed self and reduced single agency funding plans and increased community capacity by focusing on the overall need. I introduce to you the Homelessness Planning Council Board Chair, Jaha Martin. Thank you, April, and good evening to all of you. I am Jaha Martin, and I am the chairman of the Homelessness Planning Council. It is an honor to serve in this role and be a part of the exciting work that Nashville's Continuum of Care is engaging in to end homelessness. In my full-time employment, I am a coordinated entry social worker with Tennessee Valley Healthcare System, also known as the Nashville VA where I provide needed linkage and coordination of VA and community resources for veterans experiencing homelessness. In this role, I also get to serve on two other continuums of care within the Tennessee area. We have seven total in our catchment area. And continue to expand my knowledge base on governance and HUD policies. It is my sincere hope that Metro Council will pass this critical piece of legislation at the requested 50 million. This legislation provides needed funding and resources to aid those individuals and families experiencing homelessness to not just obtain but also sustain permanent housing. This will support the work of the agencies within the continuum of care to continue to move this work forward. 
As a homelessness planning council, we are moving towards stronger governance with the assistance of HUD technical assistance staff and an engaged and active executive committee. We are continuing to work towards more actionable outcomes and having the ability to provide more regular reports to our Metro Council. It is the goal of the continuum of care to be guided by best practices in homelessness as you heard Dr. Savage talk about. Some of these practices include housing first, trauma-informed care, a person-centered approach, critical time intervention, assertive community treatment teams, and supportive services. Now I know some of you all are sitting there thinking, what does this really all mean? And how does this, and does it even really work? Well, I'm glad that I had you all, I could read your minds and answer this question for you. So prior to this role, I was a HUD VA supportive housing social worker for seven years. Many people are aware of this program, it's called HUD VASH. And the VA doesn't oftentimes get positive publicity, but in this instance, I think the VA has been ahead of the times. And so during during my role as a HUD VASH social worker, I was able to witness how these best practices not only work, but can save lives and have both measurable and immeasurable outcomes. Some of the immeasurable outcomes that we will never be able to give you data on include you are able to witness individuals and families that are housed, begin to address various stressors that contributed to their homelessness because they are removed from the trauma of being homeless. Now they can address some of the other traumas that they are experiencing. They gain stronger social support. They regain their self-confidence confidence. I've seen people who have rebuilt broken familiar relationships reconnect with people they have not talked to in 20 and 30 years. Some parents who are now able to connect with children. I have seen where people have had extreme changes of improved mental and physical health to where their skin, their hair, all of those things just look so different. They smile, they began to take care of those things that they just weren't able to address while having street homelessness. These are just a few of the many examples that I was able to witness when I was able to see uh, someone come from little street homelessness to housing. Metro Council, we as a city have a rare opportunity to help those that are experiencing homelessness by investing $50 million towards resources. This type of access will not only be life-giving, but it's life-saving for so many of our most vulnerable residents. As we often say in the work that we do in the community, that this is a matter of life and death. Politics, yes, I know that's why you all are here, but these are human beings who have lives, and this is a matter of life and death with this legislation. I'm hopeful that on October 4th, this Metro Council will be recorded as change agents for those experiencing homelessness in Nashville. And I want to leave you with this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of societal transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. So I am hopeful that we will not be silenced and that we will be the change agents that Nashville deserves. So thank you so much for your time. All righty, next we have Angie Hubbard. I believe she's on virtually. Hi, good afternoon. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person. I'm a little under the weather. But I wanted to take a few minutes and put this request in context of how we're addressing our housing crisis throughout the city. This is something um, that I'm asked about often and first to assure you, I have been deeply um, part of these conversations working alongside April and Stacy and others um, throughout this uh, proposal development. But I wanted to put a few things in context for you uh, with, a, with our approach to addressing homelessness. Addressing our housing crisis crisis is deeply complex. And just like um, many of you have heard me say, building a house, it takes more than one tool. And in fact, you use many different tools um, on different parts of the house. The same is with our approach. And the Affordable Task Force itself recognized that in its report and made many recommendations to tackle our housing crisis from multiple angles. 
Without a doubt, the Barnes Fund is one of our most, one of our most effective tools and it has such great proven results. And of course, we would love to see that funded at a robust level and know that our nonprofits can step up and deliver. But with over 3,000 rental units funded since its inception over nine years ago, only 10% of those are targeted to households with incomes at 30% or below the area median income. And none of those are for permanent supportive housing that utilizes both the coordinated entry system and the housing first model. The housing division has been rolling out new programs like the mixed income pilot and the catalyst fund that target completely different segments of our market. But this request, and I'm gonna focus right now on the 25 million particularly as it relates to affordable housing, adds to our toolkit a resource that doesn't exist. So first I want to um, answer a question you may have. Why are we actually not seeing much permanent supportive housing or zero to 30 housing proposed through our existing programs? Simply put, this is the hardest housing to create. I'm sure you're going to hear from others throughout this meeting on their various challenges, but I wanted to share from my seat in the stands, both through my years of funding affordable housing as, as well as from the development side. It costs as much to build permanent supportive housing and housing for um, deeply affordable units as it does any other type of housing. Yet this requires a very different type of capital stack. The, different, the deeper the affordability to target, the deeper the subsidy. And a critical part of permanent supportive housing is the S, the services, which have been essentially void at worst or misaligned with our housing efforts at best. This proposal brings that systems approach of housing plus Plus services. The funding me mechanism proposed is unlike our current local programs, but not unproven either. MDHA has the ability to create a revolving loan fund, which we don't have locally. Um, this funding can be sustainable. They also have the ability to partner with for-profit developers, which is very beneficial for um, partnering with existing low-income housing tax credit deals. They have an excellent track record in this space, both on the administrative and the compliance side, and don't take it from me because I used to work there, HUD could actually tell you this as well. The gap financing allows money to get into shovel-ready projects and not having to wait years to go through rezoning, permitting, et cetera, which we need housing units yesterday. So I hope that you will view this funding opportunity as both and. We need it all, not as either or, and keep doing more of the same and expecting different results. In fact, earlier this week, the Metro Housing Trust Fund Commission voted in favor of a letter of support of this proposal. If this letter is not in your packet already, it will be coming soon. And I would like to conclude with this. With a housing first approach, housing ends homelessness. And with that, thank you for your time, and I will turn it back over to um, April or, or uh, the chairman to drive to the next step. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, April, any recap, or are you good? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next is uh, it, we have four resolutions, separate resolutions uh, for legislation here. And so we're gonna hear from one uh, person that leads each part of that legislation. And the first one is gonna be on the temporary interim housing by Kathy Jennings, who chaired the... Oh, we're not quite there yet. We're gonna oh. talk about a little bit of data. Okay. Yeah. Let me take over. You're still going? Yeah. Okay. Alrighty, sorry for that confusion, you all. So um, I just wanted to confirm the why. Revisit Nashville existing challenges by looking at the data. January of 2022, 1,900 people experiencing homelessness, um, sheltered or unsheltered, that was our pit count. Of those, 600 were living in outdoor place, living outdoors or in places not meant for habitation. Go to the next slide. National data shows in 2020, the percent of chronic homeless individuals was 19% for the United States. Unfortunately, Nashville, we were ahead of that national average by 26% of chronic people experiencing chronic homelessness living outdoors. For local data, I'm gonna defer to um, Homeless Impact Division, Homeless Information Management Systems Manager, Hannah. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, my name is Hannah cornejo Nell. I'm the HMIS manager at the Homeless Impact Division. Um, HMIS, Homeless Management Information System, is the primary source of data in our community about what homelessness looks like here in Nashville. So those point in time numbers that you saw are when a bunch of volunteers go out in the middle of the night, one night a year, and count how many people we can find. I'm gonna talk about data that 43 participating agencies and community partners are contributing to our shared community database, which can give us more accurate information. Particularly, I'm gonna talk about the data and what it shows us about unsheltered people in our community, what we know about them, and what it tells us about the need in our community. So from our HMIS system, we know that 2,678 unique people in Nashville have experienced unsheltered homelessness in the past two years. Unsheltered homelessness is people who are living in encampments, on the street, in a tent, in a car. 6% of those people have been veterans, 28% have been survivors of domestic violence, including human trafficking, 29% have income, 37% were experiencing chronic homelessness at the time we first spoke to them. 51% were age 45 or older when they entered the system. And 66%, about two thirds, have a disabling condition. The definition of chronic homelessness requires having a disabling condition as well as remaining experiencing homelessness for 12 months. So if all 66% of those people continue to experience homelessness, they will all become chronically homeless. Other information we know about people who are living outdoors, unsheltered in our community, 66% of them are men, 95% are non-Hispanic or Latino, 61% are white, and 37% are black or African American. This one is specifically about those two thirds of people who are self-reporting having a disabling condition. The top three self-reported disabling conditions are a mental health disorder at 20% of unsheltered people, a physical disabling condition at 14%, and a chronic health condition at 11%. This data is all self-reported by people who are experiencing homelessness, who we also know, particularly people with mental health disorders, may not always be the best historians of their own experiences. Um, so these numbers are potentially even higher. This is a map of Nashville that's showing us where our unsheltered neighbors are living. So the darkest blue areas, it's a little hard to see because it's small. Downtown are where the most people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness are in our community. The orange areas, particularly the dark orange, are the next most common areas where people are living outdoors. Those are West Nashville, East Nashville, Antioch, Madison, and South Nashville, particularly along Murfreesboro Pike. The light blue areas are where there's not a lot of people living outdoors in our community, areas like Midtown and Green Hills. This on the green line is showing us how many people experiencing unsheltered homelessness in our community are participating in a street outreach program month by month. So they're working with a street outreach program. We can see that that has been increasing every month for the past two years. So every single month, more and more people in our community have been experiencing unsheltered homelessness and living on the streets. That red line along the bottom is the number of people who are moving from those street outreach programs directly into permanent housing. We can see that number has not been able to increase along with the number of people who are living outside. So over the past two years, this number has increased from under 500 to over 1,500. This slide is about the length of time it takes people to move into permanent housing. So on average, people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness in Nashville are experiencing homelessness for five years and two weeks before they move into permanent housing. That's a long time. We also know that once people start working with a street outreach program, on average, they move into permanent housing in four months and three weeks. So when people have services, when they're working with street outreach programs, they're able to move into permanent housing much quicker when we have enough services for people. 
This graph unfortunately is also showing us that the amount of days it's taking people to move into permanent housing from street outreach has been increasing over the past two years. So as more and more people are living on the streets, uh, we can see that in March 2021, it took about 120 days for people to move into permanent housing. That's now at over 200. So over the past two years, more and more of our community members have been living outside and it's taking longer and longer for us to move them into permanent housing. This is to show us the green line is the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness in our community, again, over the past two years, and as it's been increasing. And that orange line is the number of emergency shelter beds we have in our community with all of our emergency shelters. It fluctuates a little bit seasonally because we have more beds in the winter. And you can see that around December of 2021 and January of 2022 is when the number of people living outside in the community surpassed the number of emergency shelter beds that we have. So as it stands now, if every single emergency shelter bed was empty and we could move people outside into them now, we still would not have enough emergency shelter temporary options for people to get everyone who lives outdoors inside. And the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is permanent supportive housing. This again is showing us the number of people who are experiencing chronic unsheltered homelessness every month for the past two years. That is the orange bars. So again, that's people who have a disabling condition and have been living, experiencing homelessness for at least 12 months in the past three years. That has been increasing every month since September, 2020. The teal lines are the number of permanent supportive housing beds. Permanent supportive housing is directly for our most vulnerable people who need more housing and support. During the same time period that the number of people experiencing chronic unsheltered homelessness increased from 215 to 864, the number of permanent supportive housing beds in our community decreased by 52 when we're talking about beds that are not for veterans. So we saw earlier that 94% of people who are living outdoors are not veterans, and we do not have enough permanent supportive housing beds again if we could move someone into all of those beds tomorrow, which we can't because most of them are occupied, we still would not have enough for everyone who needs permanent supportive housing in our community. Thank you. Thank you for that, Hannah. As you may have heard me say, this investment is more than a dollar allocation. It's more than words on a paper. It's more than a proposal to be approved. It's a historical funding. It is literally what will take hundreds of people from hopelessness to homes, from streets to stability, from impending danger to safety. As you listen to the investment priorities, please remember for a successful housing crisis resolution portfolio, the funds are all dependent on each other for success. This investment will reduce the bottleneck in our current system these funds are performance-based with the ability to be tooled and retooled for success. The, the design to meet the need of the most vulnerable here in Nashville um, is uti will utilize our coordinated entry system. Ask yourself, will this investment help to reduce, resolve, or remediate any of the issues our overall data reveals about our community. Next, I would like to hand it off to Kathy. Sorry, you're correct. Next, I would like to hand it off to Sam Simbaris. He's um, with us virtually. Hi, good evening, everyone, uh, council members and uh, distinguished colleagues. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm going to take a moment here to give you a postage stamp definition of housing first, uh, and we'll get into more of the details about how the program operates a little bit uh, later on. But you've already heard from uh, the mayor and uh, Dr. Savage and others about this commitment to using a housing first approach. and. The reason that this commitment is taking place is that there is a solution to all of the problems that you have heard about uh, in terms of the data in Nashville. Uh, 
and an effective intervention for uh, ending chronic homelessness over a period of time. The question is, what do we use and why would we use housing first and how will that help us? Well, the data from a number of studies has shown to us that a housing first approach is extremely helpful for helping especially the most vulnerable people. Given the numbers of people we have to serve, we start somewhere. And this intervention is targeted particularly at those people that would be unable, even if they could have the financial resources to get off the streets on their own. The reason to focus on this group is uh, they are the most vulnerable. People with severe mental illness typically die 20 years earlier than the uh, population that's housed, so that there's an urgency to this. Uh, housing First has the goal of achieving housing stability for this population that has really been uh, unable to be served by the system as it exists right now. There are a small number of Housing First initiatives right now in Nashville, but we're talking about bringing this type of an approach to scale so that it can do justice to the numbers that we need to serve. Housing First begins with housing, but it is a combination of housing and services, as you've heard. I, I will describe the services a little bit further on and to say that the goal here is not just to achieve an end to homelessness for this population that has health and mental health and addiction issues, as you've heard, but also to promote recovery and community integration. And why, and why start with this group is, uh, is an assist to the system in general. People who are chronically homeless are using, they're only about 19%, I believe was the number we heard for, for Nashville. This group uses 50% of the system resources, outreach, shelters, and so on. So it kind of slows down the capacity of the rest of the system because people who are chronically homeless remain in that system. By moving that group out first, it actually enhances the capacity of other parts of the system to work effectively. I'll say more about all of this uh, when we talk about the proposal specifically, but just for, to underline and underscore the fact that when the, with the proper resources and the correct operational methods, you know, program fidelity is important. We have to get this right. The right amount of support services and housing, immediate access to housing. The four months you heard is totally uh, possible with this kind of approach. Uh, we can achieve an 80 or 90% success rate in housing stability for this population. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, April. Okay, next I believe that we're gonna talk about the um, $9 million of temporary. I think we have a, uh, we're gonna make an adjustment. Um, oh, okay. We're gonna open it up to the Metro Council to ask any questions um, while April and her team are right up here. So uh, let me open up to, uh, to council members if you could raise your hand as you get a chance. Thank you. <clears throat> let me recognize uh, uh, Council A. Johnston first. Thank you. So um, I appreciate everyone being here. I don't think, no one's here questioning the why. Everybody knows the why. Um, I think we really want to get into what these resolutions are doing, how this money is going to be spent. Is this the, is this the best way to do it? So I, I would like to jump to the specifics of the legislation and we can go in the order that the agenda says, but I want to talk about each one of them uh, separately. So the first one is 1698 about temporary interim housing. Um, I, the resolution speaks specifically about the mobile navigation units, nothing else, which is fine with me. In this, uh, the question and answer deal, they talked about uh, micro housing, but I think we've stepped away from micro housing. Is that correct because of the cost of it? So is that off the table? So that's, that's next. That'll be what I get into when I do my part. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. 
If I could uh, suggest uh, the, the next section is in all the individual resolutions. Uh, so it may be Council Lady Johnson worth letting, uh, letting that go through and then ask questions. That's uh, fine. I just want to make sure that each one of these resolutions, we, the council is going to dive into each one of the resolutions. It's not just a presentation because okay. we can, we can read, we know what it is. We just, let's get, let's get, this is supposed to be a work session. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilman O'Connell. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'll I'll defer comment too. I mean, I've I've got a variety of questions on RS twenty two twenty two sixteen ninety six in particular. So if it's more appropriate to wait till we get to that point, I just I I'm going to echo Councilmember Johnson here. I want to make sure this is a work session. I, I totally agree. I think it's uh, that uh, it's still worth the presentation from the person that's uh, going to be discussing it. And uh, would you like to do each one after the presentation, or would you suggest having all four presentations first? All four? Each one? Each one. Okay. Uh, so uh, next up is, is uh, resolution um, on temporary interim housing by Kathy Jennings on uh, resolution 2022-1698. So uh, the way we're gonna format this is uh, Ms. Jennings will make the presentation and then we'll ask the questions right after that. Everybody okay with that? Okay, thanks. Great. So hi everybody, good evening. My name, my name is Kathy Jennings. Some of you know me, I'm the director of the Contributor Street Paper Vending and Housing Program. But I have also been the chair of the Continuum of Care Shelter Committee for around three years. That committee is comprised of individuals that represent 13 Continuum of Care organizations or nonprofits here in the city of Nashville. Um, as well as people with lived experience of homelessness and other community members. We are a very, very active committee and usually meet monthly, but lately it has been more like weekly. In June, we were asked by the Homeless Impact Division and Metro for input surrounding two items. First was the outdoor homelessness strategy, which included an encampment prioritization assessment. This would inform our supplemental notice of funding opportunity, for short, we call it a SNOFO, which is a three-year, $4.8 million competition that is for renewable funding for housing and supportive services. And the second thing was for ideas surrounding the immediate need for temporary housing for individuals, or what you all are calling the gap housing plan. So for these meetings, we, I, all of us, actively recruited more organizations within the larger continuum of care community, as well as people with lived experience of homelessness. Initially, these were two separate meetings, but the two agendas naturally converged. We began meeting in late June, which was well before the deferral. And we've had eight two to three hour meetings, as well as a lot of personal time spent on research. All of these meetings were publicly posted with their agendas. Some of you all, Representative Dreffel, came to these meetings. We usually had around 30 to 40 participants from nonprofits, um, 20 different nonprofit organizations were represented, including six to 10 people at every meeting with lived experience of homelessness. And they regularly attended and they regularly contributed, as well as other community members that you all have seen and heard from, from Brookmead Park and elsewhere. These meetings were also available virtually. I'm telling you this so you see that we wanted to cast a wide net for input. The format was such to engage every single person present, even those not a part of the shelter committee, and to encourage ideas and feedback. Everyone had multiple opportunities to speak. Then we presented both our outdoor homelessness strategy draft and our gap housing plan to the Homeless Planning Council, Homelessness Planning Council on September 14th. I am telling you all of this because I think it is important for you to know, committee members, that the ideas I'm presenting to you were not developed in a vacuum, but they represent the voices of your constituents. 
who include those unsheltered neighbors living on the streets and in the camps or in the mission, those of us who work directly with those neighbors, and also those individuals who live next door to those neighbors. It is important for you to know two things, that the funding from these resolutions works in conjunction with our SNOFO application, which seeks to leverage this $50 million funding to be more competitive. I'm gonna say that again, they work in conjunction. Success with the SNOFO funding is what ensures sustainability year after year of the supportive services and housing that we so desperately need. And the second thing is that gap housing is temporary and is only successful in serving the indicated number of people if there are permanent housing units on the other side. And permanent housing is only successful if there are supportive services to go alongside. So our funding will secure the success, which will secure more funding, which will secure more success, and exponentially build a more cohesive, effective, sustainable system for the future of our city. So our recommendations were guided by the principles of trauma-informed care with dignity, compassion, and choice. And our recommendations are to expand the use of hotels and existing faith-based facilities through expanding mobile housing navigation centers and taking the rest of the hotel rooms at the hotel formerly known as Roadway. This was a very robust discussion. We met for hours, we whiteboarded all of the options, and these were the most effective economic options for these temporary housing. They will include 24, let's see, yeah, 24 hours, seven day a week staffing, and if feasible, to establish micro communities, not as previously presented, but on private or public property to create additional temporary housing and choice for the unhoused. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So I, don't, I have paid no attention to the slides. So I have next slide in my notes. So these ideas are not even, th this is the one. These ideas are not even remotely close to what a sanctioned encampment is. We recognize that everyone deserves a safe place to live, and right now, many, if not all of the places people are living are not even close to being safe. Obviously, the best case scenario would be to move someone directly to permanent housing. That's the best case scenario. But when that's not an option, while we wait for these permanent housing options to be built, having a safe, temporary place to begin services is necessary. So our goal is to serve 800 to 1,000 individuals with temporary housing by fall of 2024. We will use the coordinated entry system and focus on the most vulnerable, ensuring that people have some choices, which includes large congregate settings, small congregate settings, and individual units. So here's some hotel specifics. If we take all the rooms at the roadway and provide security and staffing, this will immediately improve the quality of life of the residents and the surrounding communities. The contributor rapidly rehoused dozens of people at the roadway. Most of those people now have been moved into permanent supportive housing. This was our first rapid rehousing program, and I could go on and on about stories, but it works. It takes time, but it works. If you have questions, I am intimately acquainted with this property, the management, and the program. So please feel free to ask me any questions about that. And as for the mobile housing navigation centers, these small settings are very cost effective. They can rapidly expand and contract. They can organically develop a support community that not only includes the organizations providing the services, but also the church congregations and ancillary functions that are held within that church, like AA meetings, counseling services, anger management things. Do you know what I'm saying? And then as far as the micro housing, we recommend that they explore options to maybe attach a few of these units. Several of the churches have extra property, so maybe you put two or three there. That's very feasible in cost, not any more than the hotel rooms. And it creates a link to the mobile housing navigation center already on site there in the community that's been developed. 
and then the next slide. So other items to note, this program is based on a housing first model, extremely low barriers to housing and very cost effective. Faith-based agencies will lower barriers to accommodate needs of the individuals. Um, funding to agencies providing housing under this effort will be required by contract to be low barrier and provide services to all, regardless of race, religion, gender identity, family structure, including age and the sex of the children or parents, sexual orientation or culture. All HUD-funded programs are required to provide fair, equitable access. Non-compliance can trigger recapture of federal funds. Organizational contracts will come before the council before approval, right? So, for approval. So you will have the opportunity to review, review every organizational contract. So finally, I sent a letter to you all last week and um, it was signed by a vast array of people who worked for hours on these plans that we put before the Homeless Planning Council and Metro. And in that letter, we really implore I mean, implore that you vote yes on these resolutions without the amendments. So I understand, and I'm just going to speak freely here, that there are amendments, amendments pending for very good causes, for very good organizations that we all love, that we all depend upon. And it is a hard thing it is a hard thing to say no to those causes. But this bucket of money, for all of the reasons I mentioned above, needs to go towards sheltering the chronically homeless. Breaking apart these resolutions, no matter how good the purpose is, would quite, quite frankly jeopardize a very open and transparent process that many of our nonprofits and citizens have taken a part of I mean, quite frankly, it would destroy that tenuous unity that we are building to, to make this a better system for our neighbors. It is a matter of life and death. This is not about politics. And I just wanted to name some of the organizations so you all know who I'm speaking of. Um, Jaha Martin of the Homeless Planning Council, Rachel Hester of Room in the Inn, um, Alex Smith, who's a member with lived experience and a member of CAB, um, Reverend Jay Voorhees of City Road Chapel United Methodist Church. Kimberly Etherly, a person with lived experience who lives in one of the mobile housing navigations units. Ryan Lamper, Brian Lampa, People Fat Loving Nashville. Lee Holland, who works with Metro Homeless Impact Division. Ryan Lasore of Community Care Fellowship. Jennifer Reason of Safe Haven Family Shelter. Lindsey Krinks of Open Table Nashville. These are all in support of passing these resolutions without amendment. Lisa Wysocki of Colby's Army, uh, Captain Philip Canning and Freddie Valkoral of the Salvation Army, Nashville Area Command, Meredith McLeod Jowlin of Shower the People, Sheila Decker, lived experience and a CAB member, Tracy Pekovich, program manager of Mental Health Co-op, Bradley Siegel, who's a member with lived experience, Kimberly Perkins, I see you back there, Kimberly, a member with lived experience, Will Connolly, CEO of Park Center, Jonathan Rizzo, a community member, Mary Catherine Rand, executive director of Mary Parish Center, Albert Ballone with lived experience, H.G. Stovall, the interim executive director of Nashville Launchpad, Crystal Wolverton of Neighborhood Health, April Burns Norris, Community Bridges Incorporated, Josephine Boone with lived experience, she lives at the Mission, Whitney Riddell of Nashville Veterans Administration Medical Center, and then we had a few others, Jim, Jim Hudson, Chris Feiselman, Nashville Rescue Mission participated in these discussions. So these are all organizations who put aside their personal organizational needs for the greater good to pass this funding as represented to help Nashville house its chronically homeless. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. And I had a chance to go to several of those committee meetings, very direct, uh, very open conversation. So uh, I, I was, uh, great job, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Council, Council Lady Johnson. Thank you. Um, so in the actual resolution, the only thing that it says is temporary interim gap housing. 
Um, just for the record, I'm not against this. I want to make sure that we are building in enough specificity so that we can have enough accountability for where the money is being spent and how successful the programming is. But I also want to make sure that we are fully funding it and appropriately funding it. Mm -hmm. So hold on. So when we're talking about rapid rehousing, we're talking about micro housing, we're talking about security for 95 Wallace Road. Um, those all have fiscal notes to it. Um, through 2026, the security at 95 Wallace Road is four and a half million dollars. So that doesn't leave you a whole heck of a lot left out of this nine million dollars to deal with with rapid rehousing, with micro uh, micro housing, with uh, mobile navigation. There's no reporting features in here. So I would like to know in six months, in a year, how many mobile navigation sites have you opened? How many people have we served? What are the demographics of the people that we've served? What is the, What was their homelessness um, situation? Were they chronic? Were they uh, six months into it? Were, you know, Th what this is the problem that I have with all of these is that it lacks specificity because I want to make sure that we're not just having this big bucket and we say this very general term, temporary interim gap housing, mm -hmm. and it just goes into an oblivion when we know we've got specific needs with specific fiscal notes. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you that we need to be concerned where the money goes. And I will tell you that every organization that took part in these conversations agrees with you also. So I'm trying to go back to some of the questions. And then some of them I'll have to turn over to Metro to answer, right? Because I don't, I don't have funding for, you know, the numbers for Metro. I don't know where you got your numbers for security because From those MNPD. are- Okay, well, I got numbers from Salvation Army and they were totally different. And okay. so I'm assuming- I could never get answers from anybody, so I went straight to MNPD. Okay. You get what you pay for with security. So it's quite expensive, but I would rather have, I would rather, I would rather over allocate to that than under allocate because that facility needs 24 hour security. Okay. We are never gonna be able to utilize that 100% until we have security there. It is a nightmare. It, and it is, it is absolutely planned. There is absolutely no way that anyone's going in there without 24 hour security. So I need there will for it be security. to be in the resolution. I want it mm -hmm. to be detailed. I have to leave that to the politicians. So. And documented. Yeah. Okay, well, so I want to talk to somebody that can talk, talk to me about this. What is the deliverable for all of this, right? I will make note of the in, the items that you want in each resolution, and the deliverables are, they will be tracked in our HMIS system. We'll have all of this data, way more robust data than um, you have probably ever seen because the HMIS system captures all of that. So we're looking to do monthly reporting back to this council and to the Homeless Planning Council, and then quarterly, semi-annual, and annual as well, so. Okay, can we get, so the amendment deadline is tomorrow at noon. This is a lot to get together before tomorrow at noon, which is why it's disappointing that we're having this meeting today instead of last week or the week before. We should have had two or three of these meetings in my opinion. But so I would like to know if we're talking about expanding mobile navigation, what is your goal? How many mobile navigation um, sites are you planning to expand to? What is the fiscal note for that so that you can have that detailed out? Yeah, We have don't. most of that information. It wasn't in the original piece of legislation, so it won't be hard to get it to you by tomorrow because we do have most of that. We've okay, met. can it be done as an amendment? And I'm happy to sponsor it, but I want to know where all of that $9 million goes, and I do want the reporting feature in the resolution, not just a promise that it's going to happen. Just yeah, so it all gets reported, like she said, Maybe. through HMIS, which is a very, very detailed reporting system. And there are budgets from the organizations, right? And then the other thing, oh, sorry. Yeah, we got legal. someone. Yeah. Hey, Macy Amos, Metro Legal. Um, what's before you is the appropriation of funds. So the contracts will come back to you. Mm -hmm. And I think the contracts will contain the deliverables, exactly what you're asking for. Um, but this is just the appropriation of the money. Okay, but wouldn't it be helpful to know what's built into these resolutions so that we know that $9 million is appropriate? Maybe it needs to be 12 million. Maybe it needs to be $15 million. We don't know because we don't have any of these fiscal notes. This is very, very broad. This is what I don't like about it. If we're gonna do this, I wanna do it the right way so that we know we have done it the right way and we have funded it appropriately and specifically. Uh, thank you for that. We do have that information and then we'll 
this evening and tomorrow morning. We'll make sure to get that to you all in a package before we move forward. It's actually in the contracts. We'd already started contract um, the process of contracts so that we can have that readily available by October 4th. And I would like to have something specific in there about the security for however long. I have a resolution that I was gonna um, pass specifically for that based off of MN, MNPD's uh, charging all the way through 2026 because that's how long we can spend this money. But however long we're, we plan on having rapid rehousing at that location, there has to be 24 hour security. Whatever that costs, it needs to be line itemed out for this resolution, please. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Council Lady uh, Sepulveda, just a minute. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I, I do agree with my colleague that we do need to figure out the security at um, this property on Wallace Road. Um, the property owner is actually here behind me. Um, there are a lot of concerns and uh, we have been working on that very diligently. Um, if we could have the numbers um, of, of what you all have as an estimate, that would be great. I know that some people had concerns about having specifically MMPD uh, at that location. So I, I, I do wanna see if we could explore other security options um, um, and not just MMPD. So the people who have concerns feel uh, better, but we do need to get that taken care of as quickly as possible since um, we do have a bit of a human trafficking issue in the area, not necessarily on that property, but around that property. And I know that MMPD is working on uh, getting no trespassing waivers in that area. Um, but I, I agree, if we could have what estimates you all have, that would be great. If we could get that done uh, before tomorrow's deadline, that would be perfect. And I would uh, be happy to sign on to Council Member Johnston's um, um, substitute resolution, whatever that looks like, amendment uh, to make sure that that happens. Um, you know, we, we are taking care of a very vulnerable population and we wanna make sure that they succeed. And um, I think this will help the area tremendously um, and, and just give um, a little bit of protection uh, to the residents that are living there now. Um, but yes, if, if it could be not just MNPD, um, but other options, that would be great. Um, that was my main point. And the reporting is also important. That was the other one. If we could have reporting to the ARP committee included in that, Absolutely. that would be great. Absolutely, thank you for that. We are negotiating contracts with CCF and the Salvation Army and a security company through the Salvation Army and I can get you that information. Um, it, we were prepared to put that with the package um, on October 4th. Thanks, Council Lady. Any other questions? Yeah, Council Lady Gamble, just a minute here. Uh, Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you for the presentation today. Uh, my question revolves around the rapid and temporary housing. You noted in the presentation that 28% of the homeless are, are homeless because of domestic violence issues. I didn't see anything in the uh, either of the resolutions that addresses uh, homelessness as a result of domestic violence, particularly temporary shelters. I didn't notice um, any conversation about uh, the YW WCA, which has the largest uh, domestic violence shelter in the, in the city, in the state really, and the only one in the city. How is that addressed in, in this temporary rapid housing or in any of the other uh, resolutions that you all brought forward? Thank you. I'll start with that. Um, we have a coordinated entry system for domestic violence and um, the Homeless Impact Division has a coordinated entry system as well. Um, there is a priority for domestic violence here in our city. There um, are special NOFOs and SNOFOs that um, help cover those type of initiatives as well. Um, that is a definition, that is one of, d domestic violence is one of the HUD definitions um, for homelessness, so they will have the same opportunities as others um, for these funds as well. Um, and also, um, during our local COC funding competitive cycle, there was an opportunity for additional domestic violence funds to come to Nashville. 
Yeah, and if I'll add to that, I, I do know that domestic violence does come through the coordinated entry system. And so I know you all don't work in that system, but they are referred and, and they are prioritized, right? That's a very, very vulnerable population. And the housing units that are being built with this 25 million are, are for them too, right? They're for them because they don't want to stay in shelter forever. They want to move to housing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and you... Any other questions? Yeah, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to ask a question in regard to one of the earlier data points before we get too far away from it. Um, it was um, stated that 94% uh, uh, of the unhoused population are non-veterans. Uh, and I want to ask where the data comes from on the veteran uh, population, uh, because the numbers reported from our own local operation stand down are significantly higher than that. And in addition to the national um, statistics in regard to uh, veteran homelessness, um, I, I have a hard time believing we're that we're that much lower than the national average. So if you can tell me where the figure of 6% uh, comes from in your data, thank you. Yeah, so that was not all people experiencing homelessness, but particularly people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, so living outdoors. So that's not counting people who live in an emergency shelter or like a transitional housing program run by Operation Stand Down. So veterans here have access to a lot of resources, SSVF prevention, rapid rehousing, uh, GPD transitional housing programs at multiple locations like Room in the Inn, Operation Stand Down, Matthew 25. So all those people who are experiencing experiencing homelessness still, um, but are not living outdoors. They weren't in those particular data that I was talking about earlier. Um, that was particularly about people who live outside. Um, but we do work with Operation Stand Down participates in HMIS, they enter data, Room in the Inn, Matthew 25, the VA. Even considering um, what you're saying in terms of what's counted and what's not, I, I have a hard time believing that the actual numbers in terms of veteran um, homelessness is at 6%. So again, it's not veteran homelessness, it's veterans who live outdoors. Um, I'd be happy to go find out when we look at all people experiencing homelessness what that number would be, because I do imagine it would be higher than 6%. Um, I remember that 153 of the unsheltered people reported to be veterans over that two year period. So that's 153 over two years, again, living outdoors. Um, so many of them maybe are living indoors in a shelter, and I'd be happy to find out what the percentage would be of the entire population of people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, would, would you mind then getting some veteran specific data and reporting the council on that? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Councilman. Um, other questions before we move to the next resolution? Okay. Uh, the next resolution is, um, uh, did you, uh, uh, 1696, uh, 1696 to talk about GAP financial for permanent supportive housing. Uh, the speakers are gonna be MML Alexander, Director of Community Development and Metro Development Housing Agency, and Stacy Horncock, consultant uh, with Metro. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see all of you here today. Um, I can tell everybody is ready to get to the point, and so I'm going to try to be very short and, and sweet. I do want to point out that we, um, for further questions, we also have a number of experts on the line in development. We have Dwayne Barrett from Reno Cavanaugh. We have Waddell Wright. We have some other developers that are in the gallery and waiting to make comments. So the questions that I cannot answer, um, perhaps they can chime in and help me out. So the number one question is, why is this needed? Well, there is, as Sam said, um, Housing First is not housing only, but Housing First actually does require a unit to attach the housing subsidy to. And currently, Nashville is a victim of its own success. The 
rental market is saturated. We have an extreme lack of affordable housing. We have almost zero, um, not zero, but we have very little uh, housing for families making 30% of the area mean in income or less. And these are moms uh, who are living in a car with two kids. Uh, for a family of three in Nashville, 30% of AMI is $25,500 a year. And so that's all of your constituents who are on Social Security. Those are people who have found themselves homeless for various reasons. So this uh, $25 million brings units onto the market, as Angie said, very quickly. And there's been a lot of discussion about, is this a good use of the funds? Well, the Treasury Department seems to think so, because in January of 2022, they issued a final rule relaxing some of the guidelines to make it possible to do um, loans like this. And they are recommending that they follow some of the same guidelines that existing programs that are similar uh, to that uh, do, which would be home, CDBG, DR, um, other affordable housing programs. And the people that manage, for, and those programs have been successful for decades. They've been funded for decades. There's research that shows that they're effective. They've been going on for decades. And in Nashville, MDHA has been managing those programs uh, for decades. And then, um, uh, I will say that the U.S. Department of the Treasury also doubled down. They made a little guide to doing this, and they issued it, and they did it together with HUD. And our program follows these guidelines. And um, so it's a very, very effective program, because right now there are approximately 2,000 units, maybe a little bit more that are just LIHTC that are out there at, that are in production for us, and zero of them are set aside for permanent supportive housing or for use through the homeless coordinated entry system. Every single one of these units that's coming on through this program will be used for somebody that is experiencing homelessness. They will be connected to the appropriate level of services using PSH and through coordinated entry to make sure that each family, each individual gets exactly what they need in order to do that. I know that many of the um, council are concerned that perhaps we don't have enough interest. We do. We have a number of developers who are very interested. And um, after this presentation, I have a number of experts on the line who can talk to you about whether or not this works. And so I am going to turn this over to Emel to give you um, an overview of how MDHA manages these type of programs. They are experts at it, and um, I think the rest of this is his. All right, again, Emil Alexander. I'm the Director of Community Development at MDHA. We oversee all of the city's um, federal funding for housing and community development. Um, I don't want to toot our own horn, but we're evaluated each year by HUD on how we manage those programs, and we've had an excellent rating from HUD each consistent year. Um, and as Stacy has mentioned, one of the guidelines for home a for Harper funding is that it aligns with the existing um, federal programs. Rather than providing an overview um, of the program, I think we've covered that a bit, and Stacy has talked about it. I don't think we've talked enough about how we intend to administer these programs and sort of what is our internal process for administering similar types of programs. Um, so Stacy has talked a little bit about the ARPA guidelines for affordable housing. ARPA guidelines require, and one of the options if you're using this funding for affordable housing, they want to see it sort of align with existing federal housing programs. So they want to see some type of structure there, some type of metrics that are that already exist with some of your existing programs. MDHA already has that internal capacity, those internal structures in place, and we're ready to move forth with administering um, this particular program. Um, we will issue draft and issue out uh, 
developer RFA to targeted developers. Um, our RFAs are evaluated by an independent evaluation committee. So they look at those RFAs, they score those RFAs, and then they make a recommendation to myself regarding who should receive funding. After review of those recommendations by our team, we present those recommendations to our executive director and our board of directors. So each project before we award a loan to a developer, it goes before MDHA's board. All the terms of the loan are presented to MDHA's board of directors, and MDHA's board ultimately makes the decision on whether or not we fund a particular developer. Once we have decided to make an award to a developer, we don't simply write a check to a developer for the gap in that particular project. Um, that project has went through underwriting. We've looked through their entire performer. We've looked at their um, financial commitments. We've looked at their expenses. We have a construction department in-house where we're able to compare those expenses to what's currently going on in the market. Um, and then we set up an actual draw schedule with that developer where we reimburse them for actual expenses. Um, we don't reimburse at a rate that is greater than the amount of funding that we've invested in the project. So if our funds are 10%, then we pay out at 10% at different schedules of reimbursement. So the developer sends us an invoice with actual expenses and we reimburse the developer for those expenses. Once we have reimbursed the developer for those expenses, similar to our federal programs, we'll send the invoice to Metro and be reimbursed for Metro for ARPA funds. So under this arrangement, MDHA would actually be advancing funds to developers and then invoice um, the city for reimbursement of um, those ARPA funds. We, uh, qu we hold a percentage of our funding um, as retainage on each project. So at six months after construction is complete, we don't pay out that retainage until that developer has provided us with what we call beneficiary data to sort of verify that the tenants living in those units were actually tenants that were referred to the coordinated entry process. Um, we have a monitoring inspector who is on site. He monitors all of our projects, larger projects yearly. And what that looks like, he goes in and looks at those rent rolls, he pulls those case files to verify that the tenants living in those units have followed the appropriate procedures, have come through coordinated entry, and are meeting the requirements of the particular federal program. In terms of a timeline, we intend to issue our RFA um, in November, December at the latest. Uh, we will make initial award recommendations to MDHA's board of directors um, in February or March of 2023. Uh, we would like the option to reissue the RFA um, sometime in the fall if there, if we don't award all of the funding during the first round. So we're thinking that THDA should make another commitment of low-income housing tax credits by August, and we would issue out another RFA after then. Um, whatever we have not awarded by December of 2023 would be Sent, we would let Metro know the amount of commitments we've made. Anything remaining would be reappropriated by Metro to other projects. Um, so I'll stop there and turn it back over to the chairman. Uh, I see Council Lady Johnson. Thank you. Um, how many times has MDHA actually administered a loan program like this? So we actually administer loan programs through our home program, and we have tons of loan programs that we administer to residents one-on-one. So it's part of what we do with our federal funds. Okay. Um, so what I put on your desk, everyone has this. Um, there's a response. I've been talking to developers for uh, a long time now about all of this. And so there's a response from a for-profit developer that explains why this isn't the best use of funds, why this program is, is not necessarily beneficial for them. And that for-profit said this might be a, a product for a nonprofit developer, but that's not their world. So I went and talked to a nonprofit developer who then talked to other nonprofit developers and they're all in agreement that this is probably not the best way to go about doing this. So I, I encourage you to read that. I understand the need for, for this type of housing, 100%. What I don't understand is why we're choosing to go about it this way. So with $25 million, I just toured an apartment complex that was opened up in my district. Uh, they have three residents so far. That's how new it is. They have 129 units. Their build cost was less than $16 million, which is about $125,000 per unit. So with 25 
million dollars on our dirt, which we have a lot of that's sitting there doing absolutely nothing. We could build our own housing like we are doing with the 91 unit near Second and Gay um, and actually get more. We're talking about up to 120 units here. When you talk about 125 to $150,000 per unit, why are we not just building this on our own? So there's a nonprofit developer here that, that, I, that I want to ask questions of and, and open that up to him, but also uh, Waddell Wright is a, is a for-profit. So I'd like to hear from you specifically because you obviously do for-profit developments, but you've also worked with housing authorities in other cities to build this type of housing or, or deeply affordable housing. And so in your opinion, is this gap financing model the best use of the $25 million to get housing of this type? If, if it's going to be used with MDHA and its federal funds and the source and use is specific to this, then it is. Because what happens is when you're doing public housing, it takes a lot of red tape with the federal government and HUD. It takes years to do. And what happens is we've got four or five or sometimes seven different layers of financing. And because it's 30% AMI and all the rents paid for by the federal government, the deals don't cash flow. So you need some type of gap financing to make it work from that. Now, in a perfect world, if these funds weren't allocated, if you didn't have any restrictions or allocation from the federal government, then yeah, you could take 25 million, go and find a piece of metro property or private property and build all the properties or units that you actually need. But it's all really gonna depend on, are these funds restricted to this particular use from the federal government? They're not. Could, Dwayne, are you on the phone? Uh, yes. Could you answer the question for uh, for Council Member Johnston? Uh, could could you restate the question again? I mean, I thought I heard was this the best use of the funds, and I I, that I'd have to hear all the other potential uses of the funds. Right. Um, well, that said, twenty five million dollars may get you a hundred and you know, or you know, one hundred fifty to two hundred units, but it doesn't pay for the that has to go in to the subsidies to keep those units uh, operating. Uh, I've talked to uh, a handful of developers in Nashville that probably collectively have 1,500 to 1,800 uh, units currently under construction. They looked at the proposals for uh, subsidies and uh, how to incorporate into their currently underwritten projects, um, a certain number of units that would be dedicated to people earning 30% or less of the area median income, and to a developer, they said uh, they would pursue it. it. It wouldn't be more than 10 to 20 units um, for each development, but it would, uh, it would be incorporated. And these units uh, absolutely need to be uh, included with other you know, higher income units because you need that in order to help support uh, the uh, financial feasibility of these projects. Um, okay, well, I'm going to stop you right there because I'm getting a little public confused. Are we talking about the actual subsidy for the rent be done, or are we talking before? about building the units? Huh? Yeah. So. We are talking about, no, we're not talking about the subsidies for the rent. We're talking about about filling a gap and buying affordability within an existing project that is already stacked, ready to go, which means it's going to be coming onto the market anywhere between six months and 18 months. If you were to build, and I'm happy to hear that somebody built something for, with 126 units for 16 million, but the all-in cost for multi-family development around the um, city, according to um, one of the developers at Elmington Capital, is $350,000 per unit, all-in with everything included. Right, that's, that's when you're talking about with the dirt. I'm talking about if we want to build this this, But the dirt has housing, a value and you have to value it. But we already own it, is what I'm saying. If, but, if what we want to do is build the housing. If the goal is to get the housing, to put roofs over people's head and to build this so 
so the construction cost. So there, there are no restrictions about that. So, so why are we building more units? Because it would take forever to, to, to build, to do the environmental review. 25 million building new, the costs go up. And I, and I think that there are more developers here that you ought to talk to. The volatile cost of materials and everything else continues to escalate as we speak right now. So estimates that they got from subs, estimates that they got from materials, all of that changes sometimes from the time that they first went to inception because all of these units take about a year to put together a tax credit deal and then to the end. So when you are gonna build something new, you have to get plans, you have to get environmental clearance, you have to go through a very long process. This is a shorter process. It's something the federal government likes. It's something that's been proven uh, through the home loan program at MDHA. We have Amanda Wells on the, the phone from the state of Louisiana where it's been used to great uh, benefit of people who are experiencing homelessness. And so it's not an either or question. It's, it's, this one is a question of how can we get it done? How can we get it done quickly? How can we not have people uh, that are all in one building? Because the the truth of the matter is that people who are experiencing homelessness deserve the d dignity to make a choice. They shouldn't have to go into a building. Oh, this building over here is only for homeless. And then Sam can speak later on, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to speak quickly because I know everybody's getting antsy and ready to go. But the truth is scattered site, permanent supportive housing gives you the best results. Okay. so. Mr. Wright, now that we're talking about not necessarily subsidizing the actual rent, which I'm sure there's, I'm talking about construction, gap financing for construction, is this the best use of $25 million to get the most bang for our buck, to get the most units with this permanent supportive housing? If we're gonna do permanent supportive housing, yes. If we're gonna have tenants in the building, that have 30% AMI of the income and less. Yeah, because there's no way to cash flow those numbers when you're doing your cash flow analysis, right? So you, when you buy affordability with the high dirt price, high construction price, high labor price, right? It's gonna bring a lot of uh, cost to the deal. And then your financing's only gonna go so far. If you have bank financing, maybe a lot tech deal and other uh, sources is if you're going to participate in affordable housing, you're going to need some sort of gap from somewhere. And you're going to need to raise capital, usually from selling another piece of land, working with some type of nonprofit, working through maybe even the Barnes funds. But if you were not going to use 30% AMI tenants, then you can do just about, you can go and build just about anywhere. But on this, this is a gap financing for to a cash flow model, right? So it's mathematical, it's what it boils down to. I guess I don't get the math. Well, uh, the, the math would be if you're, if you got high costs going in, let's say it costs 20 million to build, right? The bank's gonna require you to have 30% equity into the deal of your own money. Sometimes developers don't have that 30% equity, a six, seven million dollars land on hand, so we try to figure out how can we get the equity for the deal. We may be sitting on four million bucks, right? How do we get the extra two million? A program like this, if we said, okay, we gotta discount 20% of our units, but we're gonna get $2 million. What does that look like over a five, 10, 15 year period of time? Does that $2 million get us over the hump to where we're raising rents on our market rate units, we're paying down our debt, and appreciation is happening, right? So then it may make sense, but it's not gonna have make sense in every single deal, only deals that are gonna be included in 30% AMI. Now, partnering with an MDHA, that's where we see this the most. When we develop in Cookville, we're developing in five counties, and every development that we've done, which is senior housing, public housing, and mixed-use housing, every time we're in those board meetings, we have a gap 
and we're trying to figure out how can we get that extra million, two, three million to fund the deal. Okay, so um, this for-profit developer, um, and I'm referencing it because it's on everybody's table. So what are, when he says a deal breaker is the deed restrictions that are put into this deal, um, repayment terms are, are a challenge. And then what I don't understand is even in the, the questions and answers, it's like, well, it, sometimes it's a loan, sometimes it's a grant, because if it's determined that they can't repay the loan, then they just forgive it. Well, so who decides who's getting forgiven and who's not? So is this basically just a grant to a for-profit developer? So well, in, in my if that's opinion, what we want to do, that's yeah. what we want to do, but that's what it ends up being. No, in, in my opinion, it shouldn't be a grant. It should be a loan that's paid back. Even if it's just principal only, it should be paid back at some period in time, right? Just like the Barnes Fund. The Barnes Fund but shouldn't be given away. that's not what this away. is. That's not what well, this says. Wait, wait, well, let me interject here a bit. All right, so actual development costs for affordable housing developments are at 350K. Um, I'm not familiar with the project that you're referring to, but if we if we took the 25 million and we put, paid the actual cost of development, we would only get about 73 units. So in comparison, um, you're looking at the project that we're doing with Metro, that's only 90 units for $25 million. Um, so one there. Um, in relationship to deciding whether or not a loan is forgivable, we decide that based upon whether or not de the developer will have cash flow available to sustain the project um, once it has leased up. So we anything below uh, 1.15 is something that we would consider as a forgivable loan. It's standard when you're developing units at this low of a rate at 30% and below. Why does an MDHA just build these units? That way we don't have to worry about any of this because you're mission-based and not numbers-based. I mean, numbers matter, but that to me, take $25 million and build it. So it, again, if we were building these units, then we would only get 73 units. We're hoping to leverage this funding with existing funding that the developer would already have to expand that to up to 120 units. Uh, there's a developer in the back. Are you interested in hearing from Evan Howard? Sure. And then I'd also like to hear from Mr. Lattimore, please, as he's a nonprofit developer. Hi, yes, um, thank you for your time. Evan Holiday, Holiday Ventures. Uh, so we, we're based here in Nashville. We have five, over 500 units of mixed income, all affordably priced housing units under construction here in Nashville. Uh, one right there on Shelby and Fifth Avenue, uh, right as you're crossing over the bridge into East Nashville in Councilmember Withers District. Uh, we worked closely with him on that project. I wanna bring that one up as an example uh, for exactly what you're talking about. I, I completely understand where you're coming from. Uh, I think, where really the way affordable housing is is developed, uh, and I've been doing this for 10 years now, and I've learned a whole lot about how we really finance affordable housing. I've worked on over 1,500 units over the last eight years in Nashville. Um, so really the way this gets done is, um, is gap financing like this and layering on multiple financing sources. When we did Shelby House with Samaritan Recovery Community uh, and Councilman, Councilmember Withers District, uh, we had over 11 funding sources uh, and it was still barely made the numbers work. Uh, and, and that's not us trying to make a profit, that's literally us just trying to make the numbers work uh, from our, we have investors on the tax credits that we use to finance it, that covers 40% of it. Uh, and we usually get a loan, just like any other real estate development, but we only get a loan on 50% of it because we typically, market rate developments, they can leverage it up because they have higher income, they have higher revenue, we do not. So we can only leverage it up to 50%. Uh, and then that other, usually that 10%, that is what we call is what really, that is my main job is trying to solve for sol filling the gap. And so we're trying to, on Shelby House, we did units from 20% of AMI. Uh, we did 25% of the units at 20 and 30% AMI. So 48 units of 195 total uh, were for uh, permanent supportive housing. We partnered with MDHA. We had project-based vouchers. We have a HAP contract on that property. Uh, and that helped us finance those 20 and 30% of my units. Now, it, it didn't just take that though. It took Barnes Fund. Um, it took 
we had National Housing Trust Fund, we had Creating Homes Initiative from the Department of Mental Health and Human Services at the state level, we had low-income housing tax credits, we had uh, community investment tax credit. So I just wanna bring this up, like it takes a lot of financing to make this work. Um, right, and so I, in my mind, I'm seeing you like scraping pennies out of the couch to try to make this work, Theor you know, like figuratively. Um, so do you foresee being able to pay it back or will this be like, oh, sorry, we can't pay it back. And so it, be it becomes a grant. Because I just want to know, maybe that's what we want to do is give a grant for $25 million to build whatever it is. But at least we need to know that on the front end because right now this is supposed to be a loan and yeah. repayment terms, all interest, interest rates, everything is ambiguous. There's nothing, it's just all this, oh, I don't know. It just, I don't like having ambiguous, non-specific, pie in the sky out there stuff where it's like, well, what if this and then that? And then I, I don't like that. So it sounds to me yeah. like you, it's, you more than likely would not be able to repay that loan back. It, it would depend. We've done it both ways, depending on the project, depending on the financing, depending on the requirements of the funding source. So we just closed on a home loan with MDHA. Uh, that is a forgivable loan over time. As long as we provide the affordable units over 30 years, it will basically forgive over those 30 years. Uh, but we've also done ones where we have to pay it back over a set period of time or out of cash flow. It, it's usually all negotiated and it's usually all whatever the project can afford to pay, we'll try to pay that um, but I will say with what we're experiencing right now uh, affordable housing is harder than ever to finance right now given rising land costs rising labor costs rising construction costs you know it's a broken record at this point but also you layer on top of that we're now looking at six and a half to seven percent interest for our normal loan that covers 50 percent of our project costs so we're now that it infinitely shrinks down the amount of money that we can borrow. Uh, so I would say it would it would possibly be good to look at you know a, a blend of maybe if it's a nonprofit developer make it uh, an option for them to be forgivable. If it's a for-profit, it's Apparently all out. of these are optional to be forgivable. That's, no. that's my concern. No. So, so, so we do have underwriting guidelines that sort of set parameters around when a loan is forgivable or not forgivable. Um, the reason why we're allowing ourselves some discretion there, we really don't know until we get the project, we look at the financials, we see the number of the units. So if we get a small nonprofit organization that's only doing 15 or 20 units and all of their units are 30% and below, it's going to be more difficult for that nonprofit to pay that loan back. So it varies. So as, as Evan has said, we have some situations where it financially makes sense and we can see where the developer can pay the loan back. And in some situations, we make the loan forgivable over an extended period of time just to get the units at 30% and below. But we monitor those units to ensure the developer remains in compliance. And is there any reporting features on when you, that's built in, I don't see it in the resolution per se, but I would like to, to know, you know, how much money we've loaned out to whom, how many units we're expecting to, to bring online with that particular yep. loan or grant, whatever yep. it ends up being, that all, you know, all that fun stuff. So, so I'll recap. So it, every time we award a loan to a developer, that'll go before MDHA's board. That's a public body. All the details of the loan will be included in the board package and port, reported on MDHA's website. Can it be reported to council, please? Sure. So we also report back to Metro through their ARP reporting, and we report back to the community every year through our annual report report that's evaluated by HUD. Okay, um, can Mr. Latimer, is he, yeah, there he is. Would you like to come up and, because w w when we talked about it, you brought up some good points and I just want, if you can, because you know more about this than I do, if you can ask your questions to get some clarity and sort of educate us as well, please. Just, just Actually, one thing, it I does really, say in here that there will be right annual here, reporting. Sure. All right, is this on? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah, you're good. Okay, fine. The, the issue is you have three nonprofits in this town that are professional lenders. They're certified lenders by the federal government, which is HUD, the CDFI, IRS, the U.S. Treasury, and they lend out hundreds of millions of dollars every few years. But the difference is, is we expect to get paid back. So it's a loan. 
And we also wouldn't expect, so if you gave us $10 million, we would not be satisfied until we had leveraged that until $30 million because we're lenders and people like to expand on something that started with free money. So I don't, want, I don't see this model fitting into that opportunity at all. And then the second thing is, and I'll just say this, I, I love the city. I don't believe you all, all the sacrifices this group makes, but y'all do and, and the city benefits from it. But in a few, in 20 years, there'll be a whole different bunch of people in here. And you all have all dealt with developers. So if you're gonna have a loan and you're not willing to call it a grant, you're gonna cause that, that council a major problem when let's say like Evan can't get his money and he's forgiven, you know, it's too tight and he's forgiven, and this other developer does not get forgiven. I mean, how do you control a loan like that? And also, all the home money we've ever used has been a competitive grant. So uh, apparently the programs change but um, the difference this in is competitive, home. sir. What it is competitive. The uh, home money. All of the money, this money and the home money, all competitive. Well, I, I was just looking at a different program, but money that's competitive is a grant. It's the basis of what we do. Nonprofits do. If I want a loan, I go to the bank and I say, this is the deal, this is how the deal works, this is the risk that we're asking you to take, will you take it? And I'm not competing against anybody else. I'm competing against the project alone. And if you get grants in that overlapped, you just need to have very clear lines. What's a grant and what's a loan? And is the loan forgivable? And if it is, you need to have very clear reasons why in 20 years, when nobody in here is here, that council can accept that forgiveness. And that's just my thought is, right. I just see this creating headaches. So, sir, Litex are not um, a, a grant, and yet they are competitive. They're very competitive, and they require a, extreme extraordinary amount of underwriting and the IRS oversees it and so um, I think we have Amanda Wells here on who uh, oversees a number of these type of loans uh, for the state of Louisiana where they make millions every year in program income through CDBG DR and maybe she can help you understand the difference but as Emel said this is set, meant to be a loan. Our, I mean, our preference is to create income that can be reinvested, loan repayments can be reinvested into the homeless community. But there are instances where every major government um, has made discretionary based on the numbers and underwriting and the benefit to the public because you always have to show a benefit to the public um, as to whether or not it is something that can be forgiven. It's not something that's done willy-nilly or without consultation and an extraordinary amount of work that goes into it. Amanda or uh, Dwayne, do you want to speak up? Happy to. Uh, my name is Amanda Spain. I'm a shareholder with Baker Donaldson. I'm in our Baton Rouge office. Um, and I've been representing, like Stacy said, representing the state of Louisiana since uh, Katrina uh, in all of its CDBG DR housing programs. I've had the privilege of closing several of these deals with Dwayne. So it is a small uh, community that we work in. And the state of Louisiana created a program that is recommended by HUD nationwide um, to do exactly what this program is. It is a gap financing, CDBG in this case, you'd be using ARPA funds, but it is a soft second loan that is partnered with a developer's uh, LIHTC tax credits. Um, like the gentleman said before, they have a construction loan. They could either have bond financing for a 4% tax credit deal or a 9% tax credit deal. The CDBG funds any gap that comes in after that. Um, to whoever said he had 11 sources on a deal. I mean, that's, that's sad. Like the state in Louisiana, we would fill most of that with gaps so that you would not have to go to 11 different sources. Um, 
you know, there's a couple things that were raised that I that I heard. The the loan, none of ours are are forgivable. The state of Louisiana has a just flat out policy that we want to see these dollars recycled into more housing. So we do not forgive any loans. Uh, they are uh, 35 or 40 percent or 35 or 40 year soft seconds. They're paid out of cash flow, and we do get cash flow. So um, we have mixed income projects and projects that have a variety of income levels. So the 30 percent units that you're talking about in here, PSH, all of our projects are required to set aside five percent of their projects as PSH. Those are usually one bedroom or studios. They're elderly. They are people who need supportive services. And so we uh, we make our developers, if you qualify, if you want CDBG or gap financing, you commit to those 5% units. And we have an agency that will drive the residents to those units. Uh, we have a provision in there that says, if for some reason you cannot fill your units with that agency's list, um, you go up to the next higher income. So if there are no 30% uh, residents, then you have a 40% you know, household until um, you open up a 30% unit and have a household for it. The, um, the projects do pay back. HUD recommends our model, like I said, um, and we haven't forgiven anything. So uh, we use those those dollars you know, every year in new projects. Um, I, they're highly competitive. It, it was sort of weird that maybe the developers that said they couldn't use it don't do tax credits because we have nonprofits and for-profits, and they actually don't want the for-profits do not want a grant because it creates a major tax consequence for them. So they are very happy with a low interest rate you know, loan that is a soft second, you know, matching the term of their senior loan. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, Council. Stop. Go ahead. Okay, are, are we okay to move forward? Okay, Council Lady Welch. <laughs> Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to make a couple of general comments before, and then I have some specific, some specific questions about this particular proposal. Um, but one of the things that has been most disconcerting to me about this entire process, and um, I don't want anyone to misconstrue this to mean that I don't support all of this money going to the homeless population. I do. Um, I definitely support all this. I, I too, agree with um, my colleague that we just want to make sure that the money is being used the most efficiently and effectively and getting the most bang from our buck. But all of these proposals are funding long-term needs and we do not have any long-term sustainability function built into any of that and I think that if we don't think about that and we also don't have any expectation from Metro um, involved in any of these proposals and um, I think if we don't do that we are setting ourselves up for some failure um, to answer the mayor's question earlier about those cities that have been very successfully implemented this what do they have in common they have in common that year after year they commit large sums of money in their budget Budget to continue to provide these services. Um, Austin just has 500 million for three years. Uh, Houston gets $45 million every year from the feds and then adds local dollars. We do not have that commitment, we never have. This is one time federal money, so that is very much a concern. Um, I actually have submitted an ARP proposal to address some of that because we have housed people over the past two years in COVID using federal money um, and we do not, I have not seen that there's any plan to be able to continue services for those people to assure that they don't become unhoused again. So I've actually put in an ARP request uh, to continue services for those people who have already been housed. And I'm just afraid if we don't look at that systemically through all this, uh, we're ultimately going to uh, start this cycle over and over again, and we're gonna um, end up back where we started. Um, in terms of this particular proposal, um, how long is the affordability on these units? 20 to 30 years. So 20 is the minimum? The, the, air, the, our, the guidelines require a 20, 20 year min, minimum. A 20 year minimum? Mm -hmm. um, and how many of these units will be zero barrier as opposed to low barrier? So they will all be low barrier. Zero barrier is almost impossible when you consider that there are several laws in uh, the city that require certain people with certain offenses, uh, 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 registered sex offenders cannot be moved into just any building. It's, 
Right, right. Um, uh, that's another request that I made in my ARP uh, to in up our allocation to room in the end that does deal with sex offenders and provide housing for those sex offenders who can't find other housing. Um, who is determining what the barriers are to the housing and who's actually gonna, what are the prerequisites to get into the housing? Who will so be making they're gonna that decision? go through coordinated entry the coordinated entry process, which is actually required by all federal funding. So any agencies that aren't using coordinated entry but are funded through the Continuum of Care COC are in risk of recapture. Um, the other um, thing I'm glad that you asked uh, about how are these things sustainable? So these units are gonna be out there. Right now, we do not use all of the subsidies we have because we don't have enough units to connect them to. So we are in danger of not getting even the additional allotment of um, vouchers that come along with the special NOFO that was put out this year because right now we don't have the housing stock to attach them to. And as far as sustainability goes, um, you mentioned uh, Houston, which certainly has, I believe, the seventh largest economy in the country and Austin, which is has an even larger economy than that. But I will bring up New Orleans just because I know a lot about it. And New Orleans, the city of New Orleans puts almost zero into it until ARPA came out and then they put their ARPA funds into it. They don't pay for the continuum of care service that is handled by a separate nonprofit agency that raises funds on its own. They develop their um, yearly request to HUD and they do it well and they do it systematically in the manner in which everybody here worked together to create this request for you. Unity of New Orleans, Greater New Orleans, which is a CFC there, gets 25 million a year because they are strategic. They understand the job that they're doing. They plan ahead. They target. When HUD said, hey, um, chronic homeless people are important. We need to target them. They were right on it. When there was a, a call to end veterans homelessness, they were right on it. And everybody worked together. It was not a political issue. It was something that everybody worked on together to get it done. And so following up on this funding, we have home ARP that's coming out, not just from MDHA, but also from the state of Tennessee. There is the continuum of care application that comes out every year. We, have, we are submitting something within the special NOFO, and if this funding is passed, then this will be great leverage from which we can get more money for um, permanent housing and additional funding that remains in the continuum forever uh, for supportive services, and that's almost unheard of. And everybody, all the agencies of the continuum worked really hard to put all that together. But right now, one of the major problems that you have here in uh, Nashville-Davidson is that there are no units for them to connect vouchers to. Um, and I fully understand that. And I wish that I could see an actual sustainability plan based on Metro's input in all of these. Um, and in terms of another one of these proposals, 1697, I asked a question about sustainability and the answer that we got from the administration in the packet was basically implying that um, the sustainability was actually on the provider asking for the RFP. That was the expectation that sustainability would be in there, uh, which I found to be a big red flag because I was, I'm afraid that um, when things fall apart, Metro will look at that and say, well, the sustainability component was in the RFP and they just didn't do it. Metro needs to be stepping up and putting some skin in this game with Metro money to show our commitment to this in the long term. And I think that's great. I think all of you should support more money to make this sustainable in the long term and everybody wants to do it. But I will say this, as somebody that's run a nonprofit, that's worked, that set up the Atlanta Continuum of Care that gets a giant, uh, a 
much bigger award um, that has been in the field, everybody has to have their own fundraising. You know, everybody has to, to, to do their part. No government, the federal government, the state of California, which has the fifth largest economy in the world, if it was a nation, it would have the fifth largest economy in the world, cannot afford to sustain the battle on homelessness on its own. It's something we all have to do together. And it's not just on the agencies, but everybody has to play their part. And we should have a system of governance that where we're all working together to bring more funding in, to engage philanthropy, to engage the state. That's begun. Uh, the city and has begun discussions with uh, the state on uh, issuing a Medicaid waiver that would make the supportive services, which I think you're referring to, more sustainable, uh, because it's unlikely that this will ever be, become an expansion state. Every year we have to put together the best competition that we probably possibly can to increase the number of units that are available um, out there for supportive sa uh, housing, subsidies, and bricks and sticks. There are a number of things that we have to do, but first we need people that are interested Developers have not been at the table previously because we had no permanent supportive housing services. And so now they're here, they're willing, and I think that we have nothing but opportunity. And so everybody's input on how to make things more sustainable and better is great. Yes, if you have a government that's willing to put money in and has the money to do, that's great. But government alone can't do it. I, I agree that government alone can't do it, but I think as we embark as a government on making this very large investment in something as important as homelessness, I would hope that there would be an in tandem plan for sustainability for when this money runs out. And I think we need to do that on the front end so that we can foresee potential problems and make sure that we can continue providing these services because the problem is not going to go away unless we have those things in place. Okay. And with that, I'll turn that over to fellow colleagues with questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Let me recognize uh, Council Lady Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll echo briefly Jenny's comment, or I should say Councilwoman Welsh's comment about sustainability, because that's one of the questions that I had as well, is thinking through as we get to when we're no longer in this room, what are, what are the future council bodies going to be navigating? And so I don't know if there's opportunity to provide us with some examples, you know, with related to each of these pieces of legislation about what the future would look like um, and, and potentially, you know, whether it's other funding sources, like maybe we're super successful as a result of all of this and, you know, and all the cities that get larger uh, supports from the federal government, maybe it's that way, maybe it's like, do we need to support through the general fund or, you know, something like that. I would, I guess, love some more um, concrete kind of references that would probably help me understand a little bit more. Um, and then I guess one, kind of going back to on the MDHA side, I guess one of my pieces that I think speaks to Councilwoman Johnston's, one of her comments is around, you know, I, I think when you were asked about um, reporting back to us, I think that's a really important part because I, I kind of feel like with MDHA, and my experience is limited, mm -hmm. is that sometimes information, it kind of goes into the MDHA purview, the circle of, you know, everything that's going on over there, and then we get information kind of really late in the process, and then it's hard for us to process as a council body. And so if we could be included as part of whatever that reporting stream is in addition to the ARP, I think that would be super helpful to be included in the in this piece. And then on the, um, I guess, why would we do this over just taking the whole 25 million and putting it in the Barnes Fund? And I'd like to understand maybe a little bit more about that dynamic, so that's one other question. And then lastly, are there developers who would go on record saying that this is a program that would benefit them that maybe are not in the room tonight? I don't know which one to go first. <laughs> there were a lot of questions there. I had four. Uh, so on the sustainability, um, and uh, I think sustainability is always hard work. I mean, it's something that we all, all look at. Uh, politicians run, that, you know, and and they're different 
people in different seats at different times. I will say that um, Houston and Mil Milwaukee have sustained their growth because from one administration to the next, it was not something that was a push and pull. It was something that they were all organized behind. And I will also say that the HPC, most of, many of the members are, are here tonight, and um, the agency is all pulling together, and as Kathy said, putting their own self-interest aside. They're not trying to make points over somebody else, and it's, and it's keeping that momentum going. And to Courtney, to Council Member Johnston's, um, you know, uh, concerns, we need to monitor progress. We need to, to make sure that that organizations are performing. And April and Hannah have already started to up the ante on HMIS systems, which is the data systems that homeless agencies use. And we need to, as collect, and I'm talking about the collective we. I'm not talking about just those of us that are in this room right now are presenting. Uh, because all of us go home. We got a nice warm bed. We're, we're going home to the people that love us. We've got somewhere to go. We, you know, even if we don't make the most money in the world, we are safe and sound and secure. And we all have to keep at the forefront of our mind that that is the end game here. And the whole idea is that while we are providing these things to put people who are currently homeless into homes, we are also working on ways to prevent people from entering the homeless system. And I believe that the federal plan is going to have a lot about that. And so while this portion of money, we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on the unsheltered homeless, many of whom are women and children, many of, but most of them are single males, most of them have disabilities, but if we don't start addressing that population, it's going to continue to grow, and we're not going to be effective at housing the rest. And so it, it's a system that flows, and right now we've got a clog, and this can help unclog it. Is it the end all be all? No. We need to really work. We need to work with the state on more mental health block grants. We need to we need to get 30% um, of AMI and and um, PSH set asides as a priority in the state QAP. And they're talking to us now. And I don't think they've been talking before, but they are now. And so those are lots of things to abdicate for. And I'm going to let ML talk to you about their reporting because sometimes I talk too much. So the short answer, yes, we can report to back to this body on progress of those loans. And I want to double back. The intention is to have these loans repaid, but we haven't saw the types of projects that we will get in and the sort of the development structure. That's why we wanted to leave the option that in case we had to do a forgivable loan, we would have that option there. But you certainly have the, this body can direct us to not consider any forgivable loans and we're able to carry that out. We have some of our loan programs, we collect program income every year. So we have loan programs that are paying back, um, but we kind of wanted to leave that option there until we saw what type of applicants we would receive, what type of projects we would receive, and then leave a little room for our nonprofit community. Can Angie answer the question on the Barnes Fund, please? Hi there, can you hear me and see me? No. Or hear me? Why can't we see her pretty face? <laughs> can you see me now? Thank you for uh, the opportunity to answer the question on the Barnes Fund. Um, so, some several major caveats. The Barnes Fund is specifically created to make grants to nonprofits. And so even with the opportunity to create a loan fund, that could not happen through the Barnes Fund. The other um, part about to nonprofits, while um, a lot of nonprofits or several nonprofits have partnered with for-profit developers for applications on tax credit deals. The purpose of this funding is to go into to deals that are pretty that are already structured. So they already have their uh, legal entities established for the tax credit program. And if that's a for-profit developer that's willing to participate in this, the Barnes Fund would actually not be able to um, make an award to them. And then the third um, element about the Barnes Fund 
it doesn't um, do service provision. And that has been one of the issues why the Barnes Fund uh, typically hasn't seen many, and I think that it got its first real permanent supportive housing uh, proposal um, this past round, but um, it ha even prior to that, hasn't seen any permanent supportive housing applications because the services are not allowed to come alongside of that through that funding mechanism. So those are three big caveats on why, why that is not the um, the right mechanism for this per type this particular type of funding source or project. And Evan, can you speak to other developers that are going to apply? Um, I asked a bunch of people that I've spoken to, but I didn't ask if I could say their name out loud. So I'll let Evan speak to what he can speak to. So yes, we would definitely be applying for this. We already have uh, multiple projects in the works throughout Nashville uh, that we would gladly be able to place permanent supportive housing for families coming out of homelessness. Um, I, I think, and what I what I tried to allude to before is that I think this type of funding is well suited to be piggybacked off of other funding sources and worked in collaboration with uh, private corporations, nonprofits, in partnership with MDHA, in partnership with Metro Council. I think it will take a village, but I think this funding will be well received by the affordable development community, which we're a part of uh, and very active here in Nashville. And, and I'm also happy to speak to anybody directly or, or if there's any, any point in time where you want to learn more about affordable housing or how we finance this, I'm an open book. I'm happy to share anything about how we try to make affordable housing work. Uh, and, and this is Dwayne Barrett. And I, I had mentioned earlier that uh, I represent a handful of developers that have probably 1,500 some odd units under construction in Nashville right now. And uh, to a person, when they had an opportunity to review the parameters of this proposed program, they said they would pursue it Thanks, Dwayne. Okay. Um, next, uh, Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all so much for being here and for working so hard to come up with solutions. I know this is not easy. I just want to make sure I understand what, what you're saying this would, would apply to is existing projects that are already in the works. Would they all necessarily have low-income housing tax credit in their funding stack, which my understanding is that has to be the whole building is all set aside for housing or or other no, um, we, we affordable are, housing mechanisms? We or? are open to um, Barnes projects or home projects that also have a, a affordable gap. Okay, but typically something that's already got some mechanism yep. looking at homeless. And would this then um, rescue a project that's not going to work or would it enable them to expand their their uh, the reach to the deeply affordable category and they weren't going to be able to do that be without this. Is that is that what it brings to the table that's not out there now? It brings on yes, additional ladder. units that would not normally be set aside for use through the uh, coordinated entry. So right now there's tons of units in mixed income developments that are being turned out every week and none of them are set aside for the homeless. None of them. That's correct. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go on to the Housing First Supportive Services. Um, Okay. I think we've all agreed that as uh, for the interest of time, uh, we're just going to go to questions on the last two. I know Stacy has a flight and um, we think that might be the best option uh, for the council people. My flight. I'd rather see people get what they need than take a flight. Suggestions from the um, committees?
Okay, so y your suggestion is to go ahead and listen to the, the uh, presentation, but very quickly. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so our next uh, presentation is Housing First Supported Services, uh, Brian Hale, uh, CEO of Neighborhood Health, Dr. Sam Sambaris, President of Pathways Housing First Institute at LA, and Executive Director of the UCLA Center for Excellence and uh, for Veteran Resilience. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. Uh I'll be quick. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, a couple of hundred units, maybe. These services, the assertive community treatment teams and the intensive case management teams are the support services for people who are chronically homeless and have multiple needs. With the $9 million, and uh, I agree with all of the issues that were raised about we need targets and numbers, uh, sort of you know, I, I'm not part of the contract process, but I'll describe in broad terms, I think with this $9 million, we could probably fund nine teams, some combination of assertive community treatment and ICM. Each team would serve about 100 people. So we're talking about serving uh, maybe 900 to 1,000 people with this uh, $9 million. And the housing component, that's the service component, the reason we have two scales of services is because assertive community treatment, you know, developed here in the US back in the 70s, Hospital Without Walls, is an interdisciplinary team. It's a robust clinical service team that's mobile, that's, uh, you know, 24 seven and uh, has psychiatry, nursing, has social work, has peer specialists as a core part of the team and provides many of the services to those who are most severely impaired. And um, the services are directly provided through house calls. The intensive case management teams have a higher client, uh, staff to client ratio because they're for people with moderate needs and they would be mostly providing care coordination, some direct service, but working with a lot of other services in the community. Both teams target the group that is unsheltered and chronically homeless. I, I know it was a long time ago, but there was a slide that was showing you the incredible steep increase in the number of people that are now being contacted by outreach teams, some 1,500. And there was also a flat red line that showed you how many people were going from the streets directly into housing. Virtually zero, just a, a handful. This intervention would actually work with outreach, would work with all of the referral sources, would work with police, would work with the business community, would work with uh, hospitals uh, to accept the referrals of people who are most vulnerable and engage them and bring them into housing. The housing would be provided through the coordinated entry system. The next vacancy, there would be a prioritization for this group. They would be also fund, housing is, is funded as scattered site rental from community landlords, uh, project-based vouchers, tenant-based vouchers, all of it sustainable because they're permanent funding streams. I mean, one way to think of housing first is permanent support of housing integrated into the community with mobile supports using a very person-centered harm reduction approach, zero barrier to housing, just sign the lease and pay 30% of your income towards the rent. So those are the teams and that's the people they would serve and that's the composition. If you would go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit about the operation. Uh, it's a very intensive program. There are home visits. Uh, like I said, it's available 24 seven. There is also a coordination with a lot of other services. People need benefits, people need their SSI. It'll coordinate with the SOAR program. It'll coordinate with health clinics. Uh, it'll coordinate with criminal justice. Ideally, like in some of the cities that this has worked extremely well in, and I'm thinking of Milwaukee in particular, 
The district attorney works with the Housing First Milwaukee team to expunge the records of people who have received warrants while they were homeless so that they don't become a barrier to receiving a voucher. So when we have talked a few times about everyone has to be on the same page and everyone has to adopt this model, that's what we're talking about. And why the, the mayor and the city council are best positioned to uh, see the continuity of this is because all of the city services, including emergency services, outreach services, you know, even the business community, um, the district attorneys, uh, the courts, are all, uh, they all convene at, at the level of the municipal entity. So the leadership by government uh, is, is key to the success in other cities and it would be key to the success here. Um, I think there's one last slide. Uh, I think mostly this talks about the effectiveness of the program, and I've already referenced to you, I mean, the Center for Disease Control just did a paper in 2020 looking at 26 randomized control trials of Housing First and reported across those trials, not only uh, you know in different states, but also in different countries, 88% housing stability rates uh, using the Housing First program when it's done correctly, meaning you have the right staffing pattern, the right ratios, access to housing right away, and uh, the program operates with a recovery, harm reduction, client-centered approach. What are we gonna do in terms of sustainability, not only financially, but a kind of a political will commitment? And this has been kind of alluded to, but not directly addressed. I don't think that uh, a commitment to a particular design uh, has to be a matter of faith or because we're telling you this has worked somewhere else. I think the commitment, your commitment, the council's commitment and the mayor's commitment has to be earned every step of the way in exactly the way that you have talked about. We need real targets, we need timelines, and we need accountability. The trust will be built when the proposed programs are actually coming through on those deliverables. It's, it's an earned trust and an earned commitment over time. You see results, you will continue to support it. You don't see results, you will back away from it. So the accountability targeting and the details of what are we gonna do, who are we gonna serve, and, and when are we gonna get these results is essential to the sustainment of, of, of a commitment to a model. So those, I think that that is a key piece. And I think also uh, just not to emphasize again that this thing will not work unless there is uh, leadership from the uh, from you at the council and the mayor, because you, all, you do need all of these different commitments from county and federal and other and other sources of funding, but, it, but the, where the rubber hits the road is the city of Nashville. Okay. So I think I'll stop there. And also I'm gonna uh, turn it over to my uh, colleague here, Brian Hale, uh, for his comments. I think we're gonna, ask, we've got some people lined up to do questions. Uh, Talking about the same one, the same, yeah. Okay. Maybe just wrap. I'll be brief, but I, I do want to just mention two things. The what do the jail, the Tennessee State Prison, the Regional Mental Health Institute, and local hospitals have in common? And what we learned in the pandemic is they knowingly discharged individuals with COVID with a bus pass. So WeGo became our shelter housing for individuals during this pandemic, putting us all at risk. That was unacceptable. And the vice mayor stood up and said, we're not gonna have that and brought together a group of people and said, we're gonna have a solution that 24 hours a day, someone can call. We're gonna figure out how to safely transport an individual experiencing homelessness with COVID so they're not a threat to someone else. And we're gonna make sure that they're taken care of over the course of time. That proved amazingly successful. But what we know is what made that work are the types of services that are in exactly what's envisioned in these ACT teams. It's 24-7 contact. It's key integration with hospital discharge planners and discharge planners at, uh, within the regional mental health institutes. But it's also true to make sure that when we have uh, offender reentry, that we're picking them up at the site and the time of their release. So I'm very excited to support this. The nuts and bolts of 
this are gonna rely on relationship, but we also know that we're gonna have to be involved with people at very odd times and at odd hours with high levels of staff turnover in many of these institutions. And that's okay because that's why we're building the processes to go along with the staff to make this happen. We learned what works during COVID and we're gonna build on that success right now and right here with your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Council Lady Johnson, I saw you first. Thank you. So this right here, I think is probably the most important allocation. Okay. These are our wraparound services. This is our nonprofits. This is, this is where we solve the problem. The problem isn't that they're on the street. The problem is why are they on the street, okay? So my question, I agree with, I don't know the guy's name that was talking before, about the accountability aspect of it, which none of these resolutions have, and I have a serious problem with it. So um, April, if you, just like on the first one we talked about, can you draft an amendment or whatever, in, or the council office or something, where it adds in the accountability piece? You know, where is the money actually going? How many people are we serving? Um, I like the idea that 900 to 1,000 people will be served. My question is, how long do you see this $9 million lasting? Will it last through the end of 2023 to the end of 2024? What are we talking about? Yes, ma'am. And council member, my understanding, and I stand to be corrected from by the Metro staff, is that the contract envisions it's a three-year contract with $3 million allocated in each year. Okay. Is that sufficient? Um, council member, I th if, if we're able to serve 900 people, I believe that's true. Let me tell you why I'm qualifying my answer. Wait, hang on. Yes, so 900 over the course of the three years or yep. 900 every year? 900 over the course of the three years. Okay. Okay. Let me tell you why I believe that to be uh, what, uh, initial, why I believe that to be sufficient right now. The first answer is in order to set these things up over the course of three years, we probably can't spend, we can't do more than uh, setting up eight or nine teams. These are very time intensive and in this labor market, staffing groups like that, it's going to be really, really difficult. So the notion that we could spend 12, 15, 16 million dollars on supportive services just isn't realistic. Okay. So what we need to do is grow into the capacity. I'm comfortable that this is sufficient to get us a long way down the path. It's probably the most we can do given the capacity that we have right now in the nonprofit sector. Do we need to come back after that for additional funding? Perhaps, but at that point, we need to be showing you real success. Right, and so three years puts us at the latter part of 2025, and these funds, can be spent all the way up until December of 2026. Am I right, ARP? That's I correct. To to Metro. Pretty sure that's correct. Um, so should we be holding back? I mean, here's this $50 million. That's one of my problems is like, are we are we allocating enough to these to where we can get the most bang from our, for our buck for the next four years, because we go all the way to 2026? I don't want to be left hanging in that last year or last two years or whatever it is that we're looking at, and then we've got no more we've got no more ARP funds. Should we be holding things back? Because what I would love to see is that yes, you have maximized that three million dollars per year. You have helped that thousand people, maybe even more. You've got the metrics to prove it, and so that's your pilot. So yes, let's do another three million dollars. But where's the three million dollars going to come from? And well, you don't say it's the operating fund. Yes, ma'am. Um, the, I, I think there's two, two, there's two questions and I'll try to speak to both of them. <laughs> the first question that I understood you to ask was, do you hold some of this money back? And the short answer is no, but let me explain why. In the, the world in which we work with government contracts, you typically execute a contract with one base year and four option years, but you allocate a maximum liability in that contract that can be spread over. So, as I mentioned, there's gonna be staff up times, so you're probably not gonna spend the first alloc full allocation in the first year. So on some level, you're already holding some back. Okay. And you just do non-cost carryovers and no cost extensions by exercising the, the option years. So I think on, on a, And to be clear, I'm not talking about holding back part of the nine million, I'm talking about holding back additional funds on top of the nine million to be able to cover that fourth year cost. Um, at this point, I don't know that that makes a ton of sense, uh, okay. just because I don't know that w if we spend all $12 million in the course of the three years, we'll celebrate that success, um, but I'm not gonna uncork the champagne just yet. 
So I think we're, we'll, we'll, there'll be some leftover. We probably need, to, if we're wildly successful, if there's a, you know, the labor market eases up, you might spend all of it in three years, but that's highly unlikely. Okay. The, the second part to your question is what happens when you hit that cliff? Boy, howdy, let me tell you, we're worried about that, but I think two things come into play. You're not necessarily going to need the same kind of a act team in place once you've moved effectively eight, between 700 and 900 people people to, to, to housing. It's a different type of support services and Neighborhood Health has already put together a policy proposal that we believe can add, can, can lead to a sustainable, a more sustainable project in the future. It's going to take about six more months for us to refine that proposal, but we've started thinking about sustainability day one because we agree with you at the end of this, we can't just stop. There has to be something else. Right. But to your point with sustainability, part of sustainability is having a policy policy that when you close an encampment, for an example, that encampment stays closed because otherwise you just create this flow and, and it never ends. And so that's another concern of mine that we're, we're allocating a ton of money, but I haven't seen the plan or the policy that turns off the faucet. So yes, we'll be doing some good with this 50 million, but are we truly going to be solving the problem for homelessness in Davidson County as a whole? And I'm just putting that out there. This is, has nothing, this, no, you know. If, but I, if I may, ma'am, I think you're right, but let me tell you something I've learned that I've been working in this field for 20 years and I learned something really important over the past 12 months. I was shocked when we started doing street medicine four days a week, sometimes five or six in encampments. The mobility of individuals going from one side of the city to the other is really striking. And there's a whole bunch of very interesting dynamics about why the population is so mobile. The issue for us isn't so much about closing single encampments. What we need to do is shrink the population in encampments totally and the encampments close themselves. So I, I was probably a lot more more, uh, I had a much stronger and frankly not necessarily well informed views about how to close encampments at this point uh, after all I've, I, the amount of mobility that we've seen and the, the, the medical encounters that we've documented at different campsites for the same individuals I'm convinced if we shrink the population the encampments themselves will either disperse and the concentration and density will disappear. I agree with you and that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say I didn't say it as eloquently as you did but let's shrink the population and keep it Amen. low. What's the plan and what's the policy to do that? That's what I'm missing. Yes, ma'am. I can speak to that. Um, council member, I do want to go back to a couple of things before we hit on that. There is an RFP process for this um, funding, so sometimes when you're asking for metrics and um, accountability measures, it depends on the RFPs that come in. So um, that is an RFP process. Also, as far as sustainability, um, there was a supplemental NOFA. We're thinking of ways of braiding these funds as well. So there was a supplemental um, notice of funding opportunity. Um, well, it's still out right now. I was thinking it's closed. But um, our COC is going through that process as well. And the community has all decided that it's for support services only. And if we are awarded, it's about $4 million. If we are awarded those $4 million, um, they will continue to come back to our city, increasing our overall COC funds. Um, one last thing, as far as that's concerned, is um, a lot of the the organizations, hopefully all of the organizations that will submit an RFP for these funds um, are able to build Medicaid and Medicare and ten other billing options so that that's a way of braiding this. It's not solely dependent on these funds. Last thing I promise, I've probably said that three times, but I'm <laughs> hungry and my feeling shaky. So um, this is the last thing for this one. Um, the entire, not the entire, a huge population of our COC has spent the last three months working on an outdoor um, housing strategy and it's been weekly meetings to go along with the um, supplemental no notice of funding opportunity. So um, we do have a strategy that's being vetted um, by other metro departments at this point in time. Shelter committee of the um, COC passed that back to MHEAD. We've sent it out to all of metro departments like parks, water, um, MNPD, health, just so that they can all speak into it as well so that we'll have a final product to be able to present as well. And I hope we're keeping in mind that, that Tennessee is not a Medicaid expansion state, so there is a gap there. Yes. And so I 
but want to make sure that we're if if, if, if I may, um, I, my job before I took this job was as the deputy chief of staff at Ten Care. I agree with you that, and this is where I, I, there's a little bit of space between me and Metro. I don't think Medicaid is a, is a, is going to be a sustainable funding option at this level of funding. That's just a reality we're going to have to face. It's a partial solution, Absolutely. which is why when you talk about braiding funding streams, that's exactly right. But the thing that we have to do to go beyond this is to say, how do we work creatively with what TenCare is doing in something called Tennessee Health Link, which is for mental health patients involved on, on SSI? How do we work creatively with 1915I waiver programs so we bring down new funding streams, but importantly, we do something called community housing supports. It's an it's a very underused service line. The third thing is how do we keep people out of nursing homes, which triggers 10 care eligibility and bring that money forward because of the prevention work that we're doing. And the last component of this is how do we build an income support program that motivates people to go on to SSI when they're disabled and can't work so that we draw down that Medicaid funding. This is gonna be a very complicated sustainability formula, but we are 100% committed to doing it and doing it in a smart way. Yes, ma'am. So if we can just add the reporting, I just want to be able to look back and say we allocated $9 million. In general, it's $3 million per year. How many people have we served? How many people have we gotten off the street? How many people have we got, you know, I just want to have that reporting feature so that we can gauge our success. Um, so that number one, we can justify funds in the future outside of, of ARP funds if we need to, but we need to have that data. So I wanna have that built into the resolution. So if you can help me with that amendment before tomorrow at noon, which is the deadline, that would be helpful. If y'all are okay with $9 million and you think that that's, that's enough, I'm okay with it and I will uh, enthusiastically support this, this, this particular piece of legislation. And thank you for your expertise. Thank you. uh, thanks, your counsel. Thank you. Uh, uh, Council Lady Evans, uh, uh, question and let's um, move on fast. We're getting, um, we still have one more um, presentation and public comment. Thank you, uh, Chair. So my question really is around um, this legislation in relation to the non-MNPD response model that will be implemented next year. How do you envision that group dovetailing with these services? Is it a referral from that group into this process? Um, the short answer is there's probably different service hours. And I think part of what we're trying to understand with the with how that works is where those individuals are coming from and to what extent they're actively homeless. And so there's just a lack of data on the, some of those questions right now. I think you're right to suspect that there's some overlap in the service population, but the first answer there probably needs to be for, for the mental health co-op who's doing a lot of that work is referring, it's an internal referral and mental health co-op from that service line to the Tennessee Health Service, Tennessee Health Link service line, so because what what you're doing when you do that internal referral is you're drawing down as much Medicaid funding as you can. If that doesn't work, if that's insufficient, then thinking about uh, activating this service line. But it's just how do we structure the processes to maximize the revenue into the system? Thank you, and that makes sense because the, the reason why I ask is about you know 20 to 30 percent of the partners in care pilot uh, were serving unhoused uh, community members. So thank you for that answer. Thanks very much. Um, Next, uh, we're going to hear about low barrier housing collective and competitive grants. Uh, Interim Director uh, Calvin, and if you could keep it relatively short so we could get to public comment. Thank you. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit shaky, so I'll turn into a pumpkin after hours. Um, got three pages of notes, but I'm just gonna hit the hot spots. Um, the United States Inter Interagency Council on Homelessness, they put an emphasis on, pri on the private market landlords being, thank you, the private market landlords um, being able to help with this. During these times, you know, um, strong connection between the landlords is vitally important, high cost, low vacancy market, and other affordable options are limited. And even those with vouchers are having a hard time finding units. That's why this department, this um, landlord engagement department is so important. Um, the core components, 
education, cultivation, recruitment, retention, and then of course celebration on the end. So for me, that's that's the model that we're rolling out. A um, couple of things that are win-wins for me would be um, in the past our landlord engagement was built on lowering barriers. We're looking to seek dedicated units out of these funds. Um, dedicated units that will be dedicated through our coordinated entry process as well. Housing search assistance, landlord mitigation, minor repairs um, so that units are able to meet the housing quality standards, and then incentive funds for reducing barriers. And as Stacy said earlier, um, a lot of landlords can't go no barriers because there are some zoning requirements and some criminal aspect that are not able to be zero barriers at a certain point. Landlord tenant uh, mediation, education, and celebration once again. Um, there's some flex funds for um, furniture um, vouchers. There are um, several service providers in the back of the room that was faced with helping someone find housing, having the subsidy to braid that housing, um, but not having the furniture or bed to put in the housing. So that's something we definitely want to eliminate. Um, I'll stop there for the Low Barrier Housing Collective and then I'll start up again um, after questions for the competitive grant funding. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I think everybody's running out of steam. I know. Uh, so uh, incredibly important uh, information, but we will have all this information available also um, uh, for public use. Um, next is um, uh, our public comment. Uh, so if you'll, uh, we'll have everybody two minutes. Uh, if you'll come up and state your name and, and uh, where you live, and then you have two minutes to speak. Like Just a minute here. Tell me when I'm on. I got some fruit snacks over here. Uh, yeah, two minutes. Oh. Okay, am I on? Oh, I'm on. Okay, um, first I want to say um, thank you all for um, taking the time out to try to figure out a plan. Um, I'm going to tell you a quick story. I have two minutes, so my story will be a minute, and then I'll tell you why. I'm going to tell you why it works. There was this little girl, she was, her first memories um, were at four years old um, of being traumatized by a family member. She went on and once she became 12, she became pregnant by a rape by three boys in a neighborhood. She went on, this has conditioned her, her family sold drugs, she saw lots of things through her life. She was always taught to be quiet and never say anything. She ended up graduating high school with dreams to go to college. She didn't make it there. She ended up on the streets where she tried drugs and she became addicted because it took away all of her pain. Um, through that, she ended up being trafficked, kidnapped and trafficked for many years here on the streets of Nashville, along with different cities, Miami, Atlanta, Memphis, incarcerated too many times to name several different programs, several different attempts. Um, three children gave up for adoption, an older son that her mother raised, and one daughter that she tried to raise and lost yet again to go back to the streets. She never realized she was homeless. She was a, she was a chronic case of homelessness who didn't want to accept that she was homeless because she figured all the choices she made were the choices that she made. But if the choices that she made were the best choice she had was to be on the street, imagine what her choices must have been. Um, going forward, this same little girl was introduced into a safe environment, was given a key, and was given a place to go. A place that helped her with all the things that she needed, but she had to worry about nothing. Nobody wanted nothing from her. No money was wanted from her. No sexual favors were wanted from her. They just wanted her to rest and, and teach her how to love herself again. She was given support services. She was given trauma therapy where she realized and was able to mouth the words, I was molested as a child. 
that I never could have said because I didn't think. I thought that's just what family members did to one another. That person is me. Um, I have now got a bachelor's degree in criminal justice administration. I am a certified peer recovery specialist. I've graduated a program for trafficking victims. I speak, I advocate, I am the voice of people like Kimberly per Perkins who's sitting out in the audience. I am the voice for all those people that are out there that this stuff works. Safety is what they need to just begin to address the mental issues. I was introduced and put on my mental health meds. I was, there's just so much stuff. And the number one thing was I was in a community of people like me with people like me loving on me until I could love myself enough and be able to start to use my voice to let it be known that this works. It works. I know there's a lot and, and the money is, is this and we need to do this for this and this for that and this for that. Figure out the logistics of it. It all comes down to lower barriers because on a piece of paper, you're not gonna let me live in your unit. I've now been living in a unit through the landlord engagement team for over a year that they turned me down because of background and credit. I've been never been late on my rent once. It works. And I'm just really, really excited and I just really, really wanna be a part of this. And so that's my public comment. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who's going to come after that? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> right. My name is Tiffany Ladd, and I am the outreach team lead at the Salvation Army. Um, I am going to speak tonight on the supportive services side uh, because that is kind of what I've been dealing with this week. I'm sure all of you have noticed the severely mentally ill individuals throughout our city, and specifically in the downtown corridor. You see them with sores on their feet that makes them extremely vulnerable to infection due to them not wearing shoes. They are lost in their delusional thoughts and most of all, a danger to themselves. Our city has failed our vulnerable neighbors time and time again. The 50 million dollars will include an assertive community treatment team that will focus on helping individuals obtain SOAR, health insurance, psychiatric medications, substance use services, supportive housing, and finally a chance at stability. I am asking you as a social worker who is only effective as the resources available to me to vote yes on this vitally important funding. If you vote no, it will be catastrophic and often resulting, resulting in death. I am asking that you please see their humanity when you cast your vote on this funding. Thank you. Okay, next please. Yeah. yeah, if you would line up, that would be helpful. That way we know. Thank you. I'm the Reverend Jay Voorhees. I'm the pastor at City Road Chapel United Methodist Church and also one of the partners for the Mobile Housing Navigation Center in Madison. Uh, I want to speak to that part of the proposal just a little bit. About a year ago, M. Head and uh, HUD came to us and our church and said, we need to find some temporary housing. Would you all be willing to do it? And we said, sure. And so this past February, we opened our program uh, at City Road Chapel. We have 15 beds. We have a space for men, women, and unlike most shelters in Nashville, we have a space for couples as well, so that could, where they can stay together. Um, we, uh, last night, I sat in a room with our 15 residents, and I saw people whose lives have been changed because they had a safe place to be. Is it everything that, it, that I wish that it could be? No, we have our limitations. But I see people who, because they have a place to sleep that's safe and they're secure, that three weeks into being with us go, you know, I think it's time for me to go into recovery and move into methadone treatment and are now clean for weeks. We see people who are, we're able to identify some of the traumas in their life and begin to start helping them unpack some of the stuff that has led them to stay on the streets for a long time. The housing navigation centers 
leaders, just as you described, provide a community of support for folks that helps them get better. Um, and we are seeing that again and again. It is individualized. Some people we can move through really quickly. Some people are going to take a longer time because it's just hard for them. And yet that's the nature of dealing with people because none of us, as much as we want to talk about accountability and metrics, the reality is that you're dealing with people. And so if you're going to say, hey, we're going to have everybody out in a certain amount of time, that's going to fail. You've got to deal with them as individuals. So my, I just encourage you, we can't maintain the status quo. We have to build capacity. Please vote for this um, to go through. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Appreciate it. Call back to I'm definitely not going to take two minutes because I don't want that thing to go off again. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Paula Foster, and I've been a professional social worker for 36 years. I know I look young, right? Um, but let me just tell you this. I, I, you, Most of you know me, and I have been somewhat skeptical of a lot of things that have come through this body. Um, but I'm going to tell you right now, we need this. We need the funding. We need to get off, and we need to get off our cans and start taking care of people on the streets. So it may not be perfect. There may be lots of questions still. There's, I agree with issues around accountability, but I think we can figure that out. And quite frankly, and I know you're going to be surprised when you hear me say this, I'm going to put my faith in Metro and the Homeless Impact Division to do it and do it right. So please pass the resolutions. Thank you very much. Yay! <laughs> In a minute. You got cheerleaders back here. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Jesse Call. I live in District 14 and I work with the uh, Salvation Army um, as the program director for LifeNav. Um, I just wanted to speak roughly about a little bit about the security proposal that I know is part of this million dollar funding. Um, and I, I also am with you on the sticker shock of the price of security and whether or not that's a good investment. I'm gonna tell you why I think it is. Um, the fact, the, the stories that we've heard tonight from people like Lee and that you're gonna hear from Kim and others um, that participated in programs like this or in this program um, is that that property is a it could be a safe place for them but it isn't completely yet and the reason being is because it's still a motel part of it is still being used as a motel sometimes and so people are coming into the property that don't live there as full-time residents and because of that um, there's not any screening procedures, right? So they may be coming in there for a purpose and they know that people experiencing homelessness or that have experienced homelessness are staying there. And so they take advantage of that opportunity, right? For whatever reason, they may be looking for um, drugs, they may be looking for sexual favors, they may be looking for whatever, right? So that's what security is. In order to provide the safety to the people that these people need for the recovery, we have to have that entire site. So security will provide that in terms of literal security, but also having security gets the commitment from the landlord that all units on the property will be made available for apartment use, not for motel use, and for use with this program. And so that's kind of the benefit there. We can make the property safer because all units will be dedicated to that one goal, and we will have the security on there just in case for any kind of neighborhood risks and historical problems that have been with crime in that area um, to make sure that the people in that program remain safe. Because if they're not safe, then what are we doing, right? So I really encourage you to uh, vote yes on this and also not to delay, not to defer, not to do any of the things. I understand that you have questions, I have questions too. Um, these things will get worked out. We're working together better than we ever have before. Please don't defer this anymore. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ryan LaSeur, the Executive Director of Community Care Fellowship. Um, we have been serving those experiencing homelessness for over 40 years in this community. And I just wanted to kind of give you a systematic approach of the way that we do that, and including mobile housing navigation centers, which is our most recent program. So we start with resource hubs throughout the city, close to encampments to provide basic needs. And then we have tiers or pathways out of people experiencing homelessness from those resource hubs that can go into low barrier employment, mobile housing navigation centers, as well as master lease units that we have with landlords throughout the city. As you heard from Lee and as you heard from Pastor Jay, the one of the most important parts about the mobile housing navigation centers is because we can place them close to encampments, we can fill them quickly, we have a community around them, both 
from the church, the community, nonprofits. We currently have 10 nonprofits that are working with our mobile housing navigation centers. The case managers on site, because of the low ratios, can have intensive case management with those individuals and get them plugged in with the resources that they need, whether that is mental health, whether that's addiction recovery, and then we can quickly move them into housing, once again, that system's end is built out through some of this funding. So I just want to encourage you to vote yes on this resolution, and I would be happy to ask any questions past this night, because I know all of you are very, very hungry. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Felicia James. I work for CCF, which is Community Care Fellowship. I work at the Mobile Housing Navigation Center, and I am a housing navigator. This program is just amazing. I can tell you personally working with our guests, because that's what they are, our guests, each and every day, they come in, they come in with a smile on their face. They'll wake up, good morning, Felicia, how are you doing? How's life? How, you know, we get to know each other. We talk about past things that happened to them. I set them up or my coworker will set them up with services they need for mental health. That's very important. And substance abuse. We have NA on staff. I have Kimberly behind me who became, who, were, who was one of the guests at our center who is now a staff who works with us. We have another guest that um, that was who lived there still, but now I am currently finding her housing. She's looking for housing. So this is all the great success that we have. And Pastor Jay is just amazing. He takes his Wednesday night on top of everything else he does, and he talks to our guests each, every Wednesday, and he'll talk to them for an hour and let them talk to them about the transition from leaving out of the homeless impact, just leaving in the communities, just living out in the homeless, and then transitioning, moving in with a lot of other individuals, and just accountability, life, and things like that. That is amazing, and I really love doing my job. I am so passionate about it. I get a little emotion, I'm just a little bit nervous, but when I talk about this, it's just help relieve that I am doing a job that I love to do. And I, I really don't consider it a job. I call it a passion. It's what I love to do. And I get up every morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm out the door, I'm coming to work, I get there at 6 o'clock, sometimes I don't have to be there until 7 o'clock. This is what I love to do because I see a smiling face, I have someone like Kimberly and another one of our guests, Melissa, and so on, are doing a magnificent job. So I love what I do, so please support, say yes to this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kimberly Perkins, and I've been in and out of homelessness since 2006. Mobile housing navigation has been a key part for me on my path to permanent housing. There are a lot of differences between mobile housing and a shelter or being outdoors. For one, uh, I have an assigned bed. I have my stuff is safe. I am safe. I can actually calm down. Um, it's a small setting where we can build community and become a small family who helps one another. The pastor there has he helps. He's helped been a great help. Excuse me. To. Uh, has been a great help and has helped me tremendously with my walk with God and as well as my road to recovery. The housing navigator keeps us informed at each step of the housing process. We also have access to different services from health, mental health, and substance abuse services. It got me to the point to where I can focus on my housing, calm my mind, focus on my goals, and figure out what my next step in life will be. And since I've been in housing, I now have a job at City Road as a house manager, thanks to all the connections that I've made through the Mobile Housing Navigation Center. Thank you for your time, and, and please vote for this funding to help more people like me. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That was nice. Hello, guys. Thanks for sticking through all this. My name is Ryan Lampa. I run an organization called People Loving Nashville. We're based in East Nashville, where we do outreach on the streets. We've been doing outreach on the streets for the last 15 years. I want to speak to just two things. One, uh, there's a bit of an urgency that I want to shed light on. I want to open up the window to, I know you guys see it on the streets, um, but we, we engage with it on a regular basis. Our numbers are going up, and it's faster than what we can uh, track with the wonderful ways that we track within MHEAD. It's 
growing faster than we can even keep track of. And I'm speaking from experience over these last few weeks, I'm seeing the cold, the temperatures drop, and our numbers are going up. Normally, numbers go down. There's an urgency factor here, and I want you to strongly consider the work and the expert work that's gone into this plan. There's a lot of thought, and I've been a part of these committee meetings with Kathy at the lead, and I, it's, it's, it's a wild amount of time that's been put into this, so strongly consider that, if you might. Um, and then I, I also want to uh, really stress the, the thought that there is, uh, like we've said, we, we, we need to stress the thought that there is no opportunities for our friends that are living on the streets right now to get into housing. We have outreach workers that are working as housing navigators with nowhere to put people. And so that's the biggest stress that I want to just bring up and highlight once again. I know the plan isn't completely perfect, but I think it's pretty dang close. And so please consider the urgency uh, of the timing of this. We are going into winter months, and we could have units online between 6 and 18 months. That's extreme, extremely exciting. So thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last one. Um, I'm India Pungar, Chair. I'm here tonight just to express Open Table Nashville support of all four of these resolutions. Um, I know there still seems like there's a bit of debate about 1696, the GAP financing loan program, but I wanted to speak to the urgency that Ryan just expressed that it would be really great if council could push through out of committee at least the other three resolutions to get some of these um, services to get this funding earmarked and so we can get some of these services out to our friends as soon as possible. Um, and I'll end it at that. So we supported a deferral. We feel like the community has had enough time. Um, and so we, again, like to have some of these resources in action. And then also Johnson had been asking um, for some specific um, information about the mobile housing navigation centers and security. And while some of these resolutions do have very broad language, there is a plan that Kathy and the shelter committee has worked really hard for months to put together that does have the specifics that she was requesting, you know, about how many people um, the mobile housing navigation centers will serve, how how much money would um, this would take to serve X number of people. And so if we could just resend that to council members, because I think a lot of um, the lack of specificity in the resolutions, or at least one of them, can be addressed with that document. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it looks like I'm the only community member here. I'm certainly not an expert, and uh, I wouldn't claim to know a hundredth of what all the folks have spoken here tonight about, but I can say this. The one thing I've learned in the last year and a half is that every time we call for help and ask the city, what can you do to help people, including the communities within the encampments and the communities around the encampments, we always get the same answer, which is we, we don't have the resources. So I appreciate the wonderful questions, the tough questions that the council members are asking of the Homeless Impact Division. I'm so excited that I, I feel like we've all finally come together. I know that a lot of the people in this room, we don't always have the same approach, but we definitely want the same result. We want help for all these folks, and I'm really glad that uh, we've come together, and I have a lot of faith in the Homeless Impact Division, that they're going to go ahead and give us what we need to know to be accountable and bring the community together. I love the fact that our, our folks with lived experience have experienced such wonderful community uh, personally and not speaking on behalf of any group. That's my big thing. I really would like to see the two communities come together and erase some of the stigmas attached to homelessness and really get the Nashville vibe behind all of this and solve the problem. So I do support this and I hope that you do fund it for the full $50 million. However you heart carve it out is uh, up to you and I trust that you'll do the right thing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any other comments? Any other uh, council com comments at all? If not, uh, I think everybody's stomachs are grumbling. Um, with that, uh, we really appreciate everybody coming here, and I know uh, people have come and gone, but uh, uh, I know a lot of hard work has come through this, just in the committees that I've been in, and I really appreciate uh, everybody's hard work and uh, uh, in, in positive way to address this, and I saw a lot of uh, uh, people that all agreed on some of the directions, so thank you very much, and as of no further comments, uh, the meeting is closed. Thank you.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.